Okay. All right, I'll call uh, the August 25th, 2020 study session to order. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. All right, uh, first item is clarification of items on the consent calendar. Um, Mr. Herdman, do you have any items that you'd like uh, clarification on? Uh, Mr. Duffield? No. Ms. Brenner? No. Ms. Dixon? No. Mr. Muldoon? Yes, one, more for the public. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Item number 13. Staff on that is Mr. Tran. Okay, so item 13 is the Back Bay Landing Development Reimbursement Agreement with Bayside Village Marina LLC for Environmental Review Permitting and Design Services. Whoever, Mr. Webb, you'd be great if you want to answer the question. Yes, how can we help? I guess that there is a reimbursement agreement that put, that's put into place, correct? Yes, it is. That's tonight's action. Okay, and just so that those at home understand, the city is essentially paying, well, could you just explain? It's interesting. It's got a great history to it, and it makes it just involves public funds. So I just want to explain. Yes, um, we were approached by the developer that the city currently has a project to replace several water lines across our bay. This project involves relocation of one of our major water lines that runs diagonally across their project. So they would like to come into a reimbursement agreement with the city so that we can work jointly with them as we go through the permitting process to also permit the relocation of this line. They'll pay for it. This reimbursement agreement only covers design at this point, and we look to bring another one later if it's successful to get permitted for construction. And the, it's been in place since 1930, correct, this easement? Yes. Does it, where exactly is it? So this water line, if you're familiar with that corner, runs diagonally from basically Bayside and PCH diagonally across to right across from Castaways, right through the middle of their property. Um, and we have an easement, and again, it's been in place since 1930. Does it go underwater at all? I'm just trying to picture. It actually goes under the bay from their property and comes up at Lower Castaways on the other side uh, and then runs, runs into Dover. Okay. Just thought it was interesting for those who might be curious about that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Avery. And item 10. Okay, so item 10 is uh, the assessment district number 111 and underground utilities district number I'm gonna, 22. Sorry. Um, I'm going to excuse so, myself, Mr. Mayor, due to yeah. conflict. Thank you. Go ahead. I also need to recuse myself due to real property interests. All right. So just a second, Mr. Webb. So um, I'm, I'm a fan of undergrounding for a variety of reasons, and, and I just think this is a Big number item, obviously, looking at it on consent, just a little explanation and where the money's coming from. So this item tonight has to do with a continuation of undergrounding of Balboa Boulevard. If you recall, we just did phase one from Coast Highway down to about 36th Street. In this project tonight is phase two that goes from 36th down to about 21st, depending where the boundary on phase three is. And also it has a residential 20B undergrounding district right along the ocean side um, included and that's why the big numbers there we have 20a funds which are city directed funds the council gave us direction how to spend that we have uh, resident funds coming in too to pay for their portion of the undergrounding they've been waiting so, for a while they've been waiting quite a long time we've had a lot of great in, in diane's district a lot of success on the other side those 116 districts that just got done and a lot of happy people were looking forward to getting this one done plus it'll really help clean up um, mcfadden square a lot of poles and everything up in the commercial district there Great stuff, thank you. Yeah, I'll just say uh, kudos also on the 28 funding um, discussion. It's uh, it's an amazing thing when we are able to find purchases that end up saving hundreds of thousands of dollars on that. So it's one of my favorite things to see. Is, thank you, and I, so, I have yeah. to give Mike Sinecore a lot of credit. He's a bird dog on that, really yeah. pushing along to find any money out in the other cities that he can yeah. get. That's thank fantastic, you. thank you. And any other, nope, nope? okay. All right, I right, just, uh, moment all right we'll bring mr muldoon back in all right we'll move to item number two the introduction of homeless uh, liaison police officer cynthia carter thank you mayor o'neill members of city council it's my pleasure to introduce to you today our newest homeless liaison officer, Officer Cynthia Carter. And I will uh, tell you a little bit about 
Cynthia's background, and I can tell you um, right away, she has um, hit the ground running and just doing an outstanding job. And she comes to us from the Santa Barbara Police Department where she started her law enforcement career in 2012. Uh, she came to us in 2015. Great experience in Santa Barbara, also great experience here in Newport Beach, um, working with our uh, folks that are experiencing homeless here within the city. Um, Cynthia is a comes by way of Southern California, accomplished student athlete, volleyball player, University of West Texas A&M, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and criminal law and criminal justice. So again, um, high standard that was set for her by, by Tony M, who's now a sergeant, was, uh, was promoted, but she's been doing a fantastic job hitting the ground running and really investing in our homeless community and um, making some impacts right away. So a sincere pleasure and I'm very proud of the work that Officer Cynthia Carter has been doing. Officer Carter, anything you'd like to say? You know, actually, at the base of that mic, there is a little button. Yeah, there you go. Oh, there we go. Now I can hear myself. Uh, very happy to be here and happy to be working for the city of Newport Beach and uh, the residents that live here and anybody that comes and visits. Fantastic. Um, so we might get a couple questions. So, uh, Ms. Br Ms. Brenner, first, and then we'll go Ms. Dixon. I'd just like to say that Cynthia came in and just really hit the ground running with our um, homeless ad hoc committee. And you've been so engaged with them. And this weekend, you were totally on top of it when I was sending emails about a homeless situation down on the peninsula. And I, I felt so confident knowing that you were aware of the situation and were really doing something about it. So I think we're, we're really excited to have you here in our community. Thank, Thank, Thank you very you. much. Ms. Dixon. Well, I'll just echo those words. I, too, have heard uh, excellent comments about your quick reaction and, and to the situations, particularly down on the peninsula, and also uh, really overall to with your uh, involvement and leadership and city staff, we are truly moving uh, our homeless off the streets and getting into areas where they have either the uh, hotel room or county service or ancillary services. So the numbers are, are really being addressed and I wanna thank you and as representative of that district, I'm very grateful as, as are the residents. So thank you for your continued good work. I appreciate it, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Muldoon. Thank you, so M Officer Carter, are you from Texas or you just went to school there? I just went to school there. I was recruited to play volleyball. Oh, great. So you know the no grass rule they have at A&M, correct? Uh, you know, I, West Texas is a, it's like a satellite school, kind of like the UC system in California. So I think there's 12 different universities. I was up in like Canyon, Texas, which is near Amarillo. Okay. So a little different, but. Well, they got the great tradition at Texas A&M, the, the sister school of you, where there's a, you can't step, step, uh, step on the grass at the university. They yell at you if you do. So I expect you to bring that sort of regulation spirit to, uh, <laughs> to the city of Newport Beach. We have great, um. Uh, great officers here. It's great to have you here. And as you know, your position is very special because you're the first to interact with people who are in need of help. So I wish you the best and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, uh, so far so good. So we'll uh, we'll keep the progress rolling. And um, yeah, it seems like Texas weather a little bit in Newport these days. So absolutely. Yeah. We'll <laughs> see if we can get back to our mild climate. Um, any other any other questions or comments? Great. Officer Carter, welcome, and thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll move to item number um, three, which is the uh, Superior Avenue and West Coast Highway intersection improvements. Mr. Webb. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. On this item, as well as item number four, and the previous item on the conflict, my conflicts are related to business interests and telecommunications. And these two uh, specific items, there's undergrounding or telecom license spectrum components, so I will be in the back for this part. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Council again. Um, this is an exciting project. This is a project you have seen before. This has to do with the bridges over Coast Highway and Sunset View Park. Um, exciting news tonight, one staff will be telling you about. This has to do with an item number 12 tonight on your agenda or consent that has to do with accepting an additional OCATA grant money to do the second bridge. We also want you to look at the first bridge again. There's some uh, uh, information and direction we need from you on that. So I'm going to turn it over to Andy Tran. He's our senior engineer and project manager on this. And also tonight, Jim Houlihan, our deputy director and city engineer, is here to answer questions. 
You know, Andy, could you just wait just a second? I apologize. I just realized I forgot to do public comment on item number two, if there was any. I apologize, Andy. Just, just one second. Did we have any public comment on item number two? No. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, Andy, come on up. I need an interruption. Light turn. Sorry for the delay there. Um, good afternoon, Mayor O'Neill and members of City Council. Again, my name is Annie Tran. With the, I'm a senior civil engineer with the Public Works Department. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss some recent developments on our uh, very exciting Superior Avenue and West Coast Highway Intersection Improvement Project. This project is located at the busy intersection of Superior Avenue and West Coast Highway. Uh, the proposed improvements are comprised of two separate projects, which are the Superior Avenue Pedestrian Bridge Project and Parking Lot Project, highlighted in blue, and the West Coast Highway Widening and Pedestrian Bridge Project, which is highlighted in green. And the primary purpose of this project is to improve circulation and access for both vehicles and pedestrians, as well as uh, provide additional parking, especially for visitors to Sunset Ridge Park. The environmental documents and conceptual design were both approved back in November of 2019. And as you may recall, this project involves constructing a new bridge across Superior Avenue, constructing a larger replacement parking lot with 130 parking spaces, as well as extending Sunset View Park with uh, additional passive use area. We are currently in the final design stage. Uh, construction is scheduled to start in the fall of 2021 and should be completed by winter of 2022. As part of the conceptual design process, we did evaluate several bridge alternatives and ultimately selected a three-span concrete bridge. Uh, we selected this alternative primarily based on the common construction method, uh, minimum maintenance associated with, construct, uh, with uh, concrete structures, as well as for its cost effectiveness. Uh, although this design does meet all design criteria and standards, this, this design does require the construction of two concrete columns on Superior Avenue as indicated with the red arrows uh, on the, below there. So during the final design process, our consultant did come up with an alternate concrete arch bridge design. Uh, this alternate design does share the same advantages as the previously approved three-span concrete bridge. Uh, it also uh, involves similar construction costs. In summary, uh, this design replaces the two, the two concrete structures uh, with a structural and aesthetic concrete arch, 
And in doing so, we would be able to eliminate uh, the possibility of any vehicles hitting those concrete uh, columns as they traverse down Superior Avenue. And uh, we, did, we were able to verify that the height of the structure is, will be this similar to the three-span concrete bridge, so which kind of assures us that there won't be any additional view obstructions. And SAB did have the opportunity to share this alternate design with uh, the City Council Working Group, and collectively the group was supportive of this alternate design. So SAB does feel that there is a lot of merit with this alternate design, and we are recommending to proceed with final design and construction uh, of the, the concrete arch bridge. So here's a rendering of the concrete arch bridge. Uh, this is a view from, from Sunset Ridge Park. And again, this is a single span concrete arch bridge uh, without the need for any mid span supports. And here's another view of the uh, concrete arch bridge. And this one is from West Coast Highway. I do wanna point out that uh, with the approved conceptual design, we did include a staircase from the parking lot down to the West Coast Highway sidewalk. This temporary staircase would have to be, eventually would have to be removed in order for us to construct the West Coast Highway Bridge. So now that the West Coast Highway Bridge project is approximately two years behind schedule compared to the Superior Avenue Bridge project, uh, staff thought that it would be a good idea to not construct a staircase and save ourselves about $200,000 in construction cost. And in the interim, pedestrians would still be able to use the sidewalks on Superior Avenue to access the parking lot as well as the, the new bridge. Stay right there for a second. Yep. Ms. Dixon. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to talk about the, the staircase. I, I thought the original idea to include a temporary staircase made sense, so now I'm questioning. I certainly love to save $200,000, but uh, it's going to be, as you'll get into this, this presentation, uh, a while after the Superior Avenue Bridge is built before the, this Pacific Coast Highway Bridge is built across Pacific PCH. And so I'm concerned about the pedestrians who are walking, still be in the crosswalk, walking across PCH for that period of time. And then if they want to head over to Sunset Ridge Park, they're going to either have to walk up the hill and around and about to get to the parking lot to go over the bridge, or they will probably choose to walk across a superior crosswalk defeating the purpose of the bridge because uh, would be a delayed pedestrian crossing. So I'd like to know more about the staircase. I understand because of the temporary, or the widening of PCH right at that location, I, I understand that. I just think um, it's going to be an inconvenience and then defeat part of the purpose for the, maybe a, several years until the PCH bridge is accomplished, built, when people can, pedestrians can cross over and just join into into the Superior Bridge. So do you have any other alternatives or is this the only thing we could do? Short, short answer would be yes, we can easily accommodate the staircase for this design. Just for clar clarification purposes though, the stair when we were working on the conceptual plan for the Superior Bridge, the West Coast Highway project was non-existent. So we didn't know whether it was gonna be five years or 10 years down the line. Now, as you'll see when we get further down in the presentation, we did recently receive grant funding which uh, we kind of have a timetable now. We, we think this, the West Coast Highway widening and bridge project is approximately two to two and a half years behind schedule compared to this, the Superior Avenue bridge project. And uh, in regards to the crosswalks, the crosswalks will not be removed uh, as part of uh, the Superior Avenue bridge project. It can only be removed upon completion of both projects. Sure, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. So if we want to entertain uh, including the the staircase as part of this project, that is very easily doable. We can easily inc incorporate that also. We just thought, again, we on our side, maybe it was um, incorrect for us to assume that $200,000 for a, a two-year interim bridge was might not be a good idea, I guess. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, your assumption was a good one, but the reality of the functionality of keeping people, pedestrians having to cross We've already determined that it's really not a safe crosswalk. I mean, it, it could be improved, and for a lot of reasons, traffic flow, et cetera. And so we're just going to be needing to keep people on the on the crosswalk when there's a bridge there because they don't want to walk clear around there. Did you want to comment, Mr. Webb? Uh, Councilmember Dixon, if it might, I was just thinking when Andy was talking here, 
We could probably, looking at that corner, we could create an alternative bid item. So when we go to award this project, it would have an item to build that staircase. And when we bring that to council, we could show you kind of what that looks like. And if you want to spend whatever the money is at that time on the alternative bid, it, you can make the decision then because we'd know more about phase two where we're at. But if that if that works for you, I'll have staff go ahead and have the designer put in. It doesn't have to be a really expensive permanent no. structure, just something no. we know that's going to be there for a few years. And and then we have the choice later to include it in the, the construction or not. Right. Well, and that was your original thought when you put it, put a temporary bit, a bridge or staircase in that plan. And then we pulled it out. The last design had more of a permanent, more expensive, elaborately designed one. But, but I think it doesn't we have to make it just something. be temporary. So let us work on that. We yeah. hear your thoughts, and we'll see if we can address okay. that. All right. Thank you very much. Hang on just a second. Uh, Mr. Avery? Mike. Mike. Is about um, the Coast Highway and, and the, the widening and, the, and sort of the lanes and the ramps and all that. And maybe I should hold that until we get into that part of the presentation few slides okay great thank you <laughs> hang on one second mr herdman i know something that would help me in making that decision would be to understand the usage of that crosswalk from one side of superior to the other my guess is that it's not used very heavily it, it actually is used quite heavily Pretty heavily yes now correct but with a redesign with the bridge with the redesign, and I will get to all these points in about three slides, but with the bridges in place, there won't be any crosswalks there for you to use. You wouldn't need the crosswalks as you can use the bridges up top. So, Yeah, um, I know, I, I'll just say real quick, I'm, I, I know we're about to start talking about the PCH bridge. Um, there's a part of me that is concerned that that is going to take longer than a two-year interval. Um, and if it ends up, I mean, so the question would be how long would it take for us to justify the temporary stair structure? Um, so if it's two years and 200,000, it's not worth it. What about three years? What about four years? Um, and part of it is because I know we're gonna talk about this, but part of it is that second span is much more complicated than the first span. And that's why we are breaking it up into, into these two phases. So if we end up in a situation where, yeah, we're, we're hoping for a two year interval, um, but if it's much longer than that, you know, at what point does it make sense for us to have that temporary? It sort of strikes me, frankly, that we probably ought to put that temporary back in, um, the temporary stairwell back in, because I, like I said, I think we're about to talk about it, but I think I'm a little, I, I'm perhaps less optimistic about it only being 24 months. So let's, let's go ahead and, okay. and talk about that. So uh, right on cue here, we're moving on to the second project. Uh, this here is a plan view of the project location. And uh, what you see here is, Superior, is West Coast Highway running in the east-west direction, which is from left to right, and Superior Avenue and, and Balboa Boulevard running in the north-south direction. The West Coast Highway widening and pedestrian bridge project is highlighted in green. And this is an intersection capacity enhancement project and involves adding a fourth eastbound through lane across the intersection. The four lanes would then uh, uh, taper back down to three lane immediately past the intersection. And this project also includes the construction of a new pedestrian bridge across West Coast Highway, as well as two pedestrian ramps on either side of the highway to connect the, si the sidewalk to the upper uh, bridge elevation. And with the completion of both of these projects, we would then be able to eliminate a lot of the sidewalks on the north side of this intersection as well as those two crosswalks there, which would greatly improve the vehicle, circula vehicle circulation as well as pedestrian safety. Let's stay there for just a second, Mr. Avery. So, um, you know, uh, some residents have concern about widening uh, Coast Highway, obviously, um, in general. So could you just speak to the reason for the widening? What yeah. specifically is addressing? Yes, uh, the city was fortunate enough to get an OCTA grant, and this grant program is actually called the, it's ICE, it's called an Intersection Capacity Enhancement Program. So the purpose of the grant really is to improve capacity through the intersection, uh, within the intersection. So they, they do have separate um, programs if you were to, uh, for instance, uh, improve a segment of a highway, which would be the Arterial Capacity Enhancement Program. This is an ICE program, which is the Intersection Capacity. Uh, Pretty much, we're just looking at the, the volume of vehicles that can get across the intersection. 
So the, yeah, the widening part, um, again, we are only adding a fourth eastbound through lane right before the intersection. And as soon as you get past the intersection, you can kind of see those arrows there. Right. The, the fourth lane will taper off and it would right. go back to the existing three lane condition. So on the east side and the west side, the widening goes away. Correct. Right? Within what, 100 Within, yards? Uh, hundreds of feet, maybe six, seven hundred feet uh -huh. to right. taper off the lane. Yeah. Right. And there's no plan at present to continue the widening in either direction. That's, That's right. correct. Right. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just some uh, further clarification uh, on the pedestrian bridges on both sides. So we will not have an elevator. I know in the early days that was considered. So that's significant that we don't have to have that operational element. Uh, and so the land uh, that we are going to be using there, do we have that land? Uh, this widening will require some minor uh, right-of-way acquisition from the north side. As Mayor Neal just mentioned, this is a lot more complicated because of right-of-way acquisitions requirements. So with this design, we do anticipate needing a small sliver from the, uh, the adjacent Hogan property kind of just off the sheet there to the right, uh, as well as the property to the left there, uh, Newport Banning Ranch. Again, these are small, minor slivers, takes that we need. And the, but in the pedestrian bridge is just a long, and so handicap access would be part of that Correct. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it there. On the, the call out there with the new pedestrian ramp, it's a switchback ramp. So as you cross the bridge, you would... Um, get to the top of the bridge and walk towards, walk to the right and then swing back to the left. Okay, good, thank you. All right, uh, let's go to the next slide then. So the funding for the design uh, element or design efforts is currently included in the current capital improvement program. Uh, the city did recently receive OCTA Measure M Grant two funding, which will pay for 65% of the design costs up to $780,000. So with this new grant funding, the, the city, the staff is recommending uh, contract amendments with our current design team in order for us to complete the environmental review as, and the design efforts, which totals just under $1.2 million. As part of this grant program, uh, the city is responsible for $420,000, which is the remaining 35% of the design costs and this is currently available in the facilities financing plan. Uh, as we complete the design efforts, uh, staff will continue to seek additional grant funding to, for both the, the right of way and the construction phases. In, in regards to the project schedule, assuming that the two contract amendments get uh, approved later tonight on the consent calendar, uh, staff can uh, begin the environmental review and the conceptual design next month and we anticipate completing the permitting, the right-of-way acquisition, and the final design by November of 2023, and ultimately uh, complete construction, excuse me, complete construction by March of 2025. Mr. Herdman. Can you go back one slide, please? We accepted uh, this grant money, this M2 grant funding, $780,000, knowing that we uh, had to spend $420 million. Yeah, as part of this grant application process, we were actually required to submit uh, a, a resolution, which we did back in January of 2020. Okay. And in that resolution, it does describe the uh, matching requirements from the city. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, any other discussions on that? Okay, all done, Andy? I think so. All right, and yes. you're looking um, to us, though, for uh, some guidance, if I understand it. Or is that is it all for item 12 tonight, or do you need any guidance from us? Um, there from are us? there are three recommendations uh, with item 12 tonight, and again, this is two separate projects. The first recommendation is to substitute the approved uh, structure with the concrete arch bridge, and the next two items would be to approve the contract amendments so that we can start the environmental and, and design phases for the West Coast Highway project. <laughs> I hate to do this. This might be a question for Dave Webb. Dave, um, so if we, let's, let's, Andy, could, would you mind going back a slide all the way back to the discussion about the stairwell? So when we get to the point, there you go, that one. Thanks. So 
for item 12 tonight, let's assume for a moment that, that I, let's assume for a moment that um, the majority of account of council would agree that as we're looking at phase two versus phase one, phase two has the potential, if not likelihood to spend, to take you know, a decent amount of time between the completion of phase one and, and completion of phase two. And we also agreed that the removed staircase should probably be put back in um, to allow for, as, as Ms. Dixon was talking, um, allow for you know, an easier access so that people aren't walking up the hill around. Um, you know, so if you're coming off the peninsula and you're coming across PCH and you wanna get to that, um, and you wanna get up to that uh, um, parking lot, for example, <coughs> um, the, uh, the, the goal would be to have people go up the staircase. Is there any reason other than that for the, for the staircase? I guess I'm trying to figure that out as I'm looking at this. So, so the staircase would keep you from having to cross the crosswalk to go across the Sunset View and up to the park that way. Or if you wanted to get right up to the parking lot from going up the uh, east side of Superior up about half the way up to where the driveway is. So yeah. it would be a shortcut. Uh, it would not, I'm guessing it wouldn't be ADA compliant. So it, it would help anybody. Bikes and things would still have to go around. ADA would have to go around. But the general walker could walk right up to the top of the parking lot there. Yeah, I see that. Okay. So if, if you like, and we can put that in in phase one, it could be done relatively easy. And what I had mentioned to council member Dixon, if you like, we'll come up with a design. And again, when we come to award it, I don't know how far it is a more complex project phase two. so many wrinkles with Caltrans and things. It could go longer. We're hoping two years, but your intuition is right. It could go longer. So I think it'd be prudent for us to come up with a design and give the council the option to award it with the contract or not when we build phase one. If, if that may, brings a level of comfort. So if we were looking, so for tonight though, on, on item 12, um, is, I, I'd have to go back and look at it, but does, is item 12 affected at all by a discussion of the staircase? Um, it's currently not. You could give us direction tonight on how we, the staircase is in phase one. We have, I believe the design for it is included in phase one. That's correct. So you, we already have it in our contract for them to do that. If you want us just to include it, we could do that. Uh, and it wouldn't take any action on item 12 to do that. Okay, so in other words, so so if, if we gave direction right now, just via straw poll or something to that effect, on um, including or not including, then the next step on that would be when the contract is actually put out for bid and then also, um, and we approve it, that's when you would, you'd, you'd include it if we gave you a straw poll saying yes, you wouldn't include it if we said no. Yeah, and actually to clarify that you've already given us direction to include it, it's in design phase one. We're asking tonight maybe to remove it. So yeah. if you wanna keep it in as an option an item or just design it in and bid it that way, we could do either one. Okay, all right. Um, what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna go out to public comment. I'll bring it back and sure. um, let's have a discussion on, on the uh, staircase. All right, thanks Andy. Thank you. All right, we'll go out to public comment on this item. First, we'll start in the community room. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, this is Jim Mosher. Regarding the Superior Avenue bridge, I apologize if I missed it. I did not hear a clear statement of the total anticipated cost of pursuing the design and construction of the new arch design versus what the total cost would be continuing with the currently approved concrete three-part span design. And the second comment I have about that, I apologize if I'm dreaming, but I thought when the council and the other commissions were considering the trade-off between the concrete span and the truss design, one of the considerations was the amount of disruption of traffic and construction time that would be involved. And I kind of thought the concrete span design with its supports could be built in parts and was gonna minimize traffic disruption. Could be dreaming on that, uh, but I would be wondering how the arch design compares to that in the amount of time and the amount of disruption to build it. And then uh, finally, I think everybody has to keep in the back of their mind that both of these projects, before they can be built, are going to need coastal development permits and although the city now has the authority to grant those to itself, this being a major public works project, I believe it can be appealed 
to the Coastal Commission who may have their own opinions about the aesthetics or design of the project, which is a uh, problem that needs to be considered. And I'm a little old school. I personally continue to like the idea of underpasses rather than bridges. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Do we have any calls? All right. All right, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Charles Klobe. I'm commenting specifically about the superior um, or the PCH bridge component, and that is the desire to remove the crosswalks there. Given our city's poor history of enforcement, I think we would have a nearly impossible time stopping bicyclists and walkers from crossing on the ground instead of walking up through that parking lot to cross the bridge, which will take them much longer. I hope you consider that. The drawings look swell, but I think the practice will be that people will continue to use the ground crossing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other calls? Okay. We'll bring it back up. Um, Andy, why don't you come on up? Um, was there uh, anything from uh, Mr. Mosher's comments that you wanted yes, to? Yes, um, I think he mentioned three questions there. The first one being the construction, or the, actually the overall project cost for the Superior Avenue Bridge. Uh, as we discussed back in November in 2019, the all-in cost for that project is about $8.8 .8 million. That has not changed other than this potential $200,000 uh, for the staircase. So that, that portion has not changed. And in regards to the selection of the structure itself, uh, Mr. Mosier was correct. The two final structures that we, had, we were evaluating were a truss bridge and the three-span concrete bridge. And the truss bridge would have been um, a lot quicker to, to erect, to install. The concrete bridge uh, will take about you know, two to four months longer. However, we ended up selecting the concrete bridge because of its uh, longevity as well as the, the maintenance-free aspect of it. Yeah, I, I will also say I think having the pole removed is much improved on the sidelines. Yes. And yeah. uh, I'm sorry, if I made it again, and I think there was a third question in regards to the construction duration and the comparison between the arch bridge and the, con and the uh, three span concrete bridge. They are in essence the same. They, it, they both require false work. It's, it's going to take about 14 to 16 months to complete. So no difference. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's bring it back up here. Um, uh, Ms. Dixon, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Andy uh, and Dave, uh, thank you for presenting us with a new design. I think it is an improvement, and we didn't even know we were going to get, be able to get rid of those two pillars, so that's very good. I just want to say thank you. This has been, for as long as I've been on the council, this has been contemplated and desired, and your work with OCTA, I think even Tony Petros was involved in this, and the in his last year on the council. So this has been going on for a while, just and it hasn't been delayed as much as just a long, complicated process and two bridge spans over busy roads, busy highway, uh, and getting the grant money. Our staff is so good at securing grant funds that our taxpayer dollars come back to us. So really appreciate that good work. And uh, I'm just delighted to see this move forward. I, uh, I think one bridge at a time is the right way to go, and I uh, hope that we get the first and then the, followed by the second, and in the next several years, these projects could be completed, but I want to commend you for your good work in pulling this together. Thank you. Mr. Avery. Yeah, I think the project has so many dividends for the public for access, um, making the park. It's going to make a lot of things work are not working there now. And uh, so I'm, I just think it's great for, for our city and it's such a busy intersection and it's so fraught right now for pedestrians. Um, I do have a question though, just for fun a little bit. Um, why not consider an underpass? Is it, was that in the plan? And there must be a good reason why we're not doing that. We'll catch you off guard. Uh, we did consider that early on in the conceptual design stage and really right off the bat, the terrain of this area does not lend itself to an underpass. Uh, if, you can, if you know the terrain over there, Sunset Ridge Park is about 20 to 30 feet higher than the highway itself. Mm -hmm. 
So you would really have to dig down Pretty the far. 20 feet and then dig down another 20 feet to get down below Superior Avenue, which is really not feasible. You're already going down Superior. Correct. Yeah. So. Oh, great. Thank you. Cool. All right. Um, I want to raise the issue of the uh, temporary um, the uh, the temporary uh, bridge structure. So, or I'm sorry, the uh, staircase. Um, so we had previously approved it. We're being we're having a discussion right now over uh, whether it's a you know it's a two hundred thousand dollars. Grace, on the two hundred thousand dollars, we're talking about it coming out of the FFP for um, parks, if I recall correctly. So it's not exactly general fund money. It's it's designed. It's designated specifically for so, something like this or Grand Held Park or whatnot. So we're talking about, and I used the word somewhat, somewhat restricted money. Um, and so we're we're looking at this and trying to figure out. Um, I mean, it, this. I believe that this would ease, tra certainly people walking over from the peninsula of, um, uh, who would be trying to cross over over to Superior. I think that people would naturally want to not walk along the street if they can help it. And the question really is, for two hundred thousand dollars, is that worth it for, you know, for a two-year period or more? Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, I would like to take as many people off that intersection as possible, frankly. And um, and like I said, I'm, I'm perhaps a little more cynical on the, the two-year period. I think it's probably going to be longer, uh, given the different agencies we're going to be working with on this. So um, I think we ought to keep it in there instead of removing it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a straw poll. Uh, the straw poll will, if you if you raise your hand, um, it would in, be an indication that you'd like to keep the temporary um, stairway in place. Um, and, uh, so at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask for a show of hands of the of people who would like to see that staircase stay in. That was unanimous six zero. Okay. Do you need any further direction from this? Um, other than the vote tonight, obviously, but any further direction? All right. Seeing none. Thank you. That was a good presentation. All right. We'll move into our, um, our last item for study session. Uh, which is the parking meter replacement. Thank you, members. Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, um, as we pull the presentation up, um, yeah, uh, we find ourselves a little bit of a crossroads um, and we were looking for your input tonight ab uh, about our kind of roadmap for, for parking moving forward. So, you know, as a, as a tourist destination, parking revenues represent a significant uh, revenue source to the city that partially offsets the cost, um, you know, the, the impact of tur tourism on, on the community. Uh, we have 4,100 parking spaces, uh, generates about $8.2 million. The, those funds are currently collected by 821 single space meters, 84 uh, uh, multi-space pay stations, uh, and pay by app, um, which uh, we currently use Park Mobile as, as the service provider. Um, the problem right now is that many of the, the single space meters in the city are increasingly becoming inoperable, resulting in lost revenue, um, and they're becoming costly to maintain. They're, they're, um, they're coming up on 10 years old. Um, so this presentation is gonna provide, explore some, some replacement options for the aging equipment. So just to orient you, yourself, uh, single space meters, um, um, that jargon is the picture on the left that um, uniquely identifies you know, parking spaces and what you see in most cities. Uh, pay stations have been, become increasingly popular to serve high demand areas. And then um, it's been there out for a while, um, um, but, but the ability to pay by app um, and it's becoming increasingly uh, more popular. So um, as you can see, if we, we look at the pay by app first, um, this is trending upwards in fiscal year 18, 19. 
the adoption rate was about 18%. And the, uh, the fiscal year just ended, uh, uh, fiscal year uh, 1920. Uh, we have about a 24% adoption rate. And uh, July alone, uh, the adoption rate increased to 30% already. So it's becoming more and more popular. So that, in part, uh, creates the dilemma um, if, because that's, that's a truly infrastructure-less option. Um, and our, as you notice, our single space meters, which are our most expensive alternative, uh, but in some ways the most convenient, um, is shrinking to 12%. Uh, but as, as I mentioned, um, it, it is our, our more expensive of, of the hardware option. And then the multi-space uh, space pay stations um, is currently the piece of hardware that is used most uh, often at the, the large beach lots. And um, over the years, we've been uh, making more use of multi-space pay stations and decreasing our dependence on, on single space uh, meters, uh, you know, consistent with uh, other e-commerce trends. Um, so historically, in 2011, we had as many as all, all, you know almost 1,300 single-space uh, smart meters, and that int introduced you know uh, prior to that they were Kono mechanical meters that only accepted coin. Uh, the smart meters now gave the ability to accept credit cards and provided real-time information about whether. Um, you know, a meter was operable, um, and uh, so, so there's much more robust uh, r reporting. But you can imagine um, each one of those single space meters um, is, is essentially like a, a individual cell c connection that has a, a cell phone out on the street that has its uh, unique gateway to uh, report into the city. Um, and um, they, they serve one single space. So um, it, it's a very convenient option, but it, it's the most expensive option. And then we you know, also in 2011 introduced the pay by app um, feature um, as, as another payment alternative. In 2014, we introduced pay stations um, to, the, to the CDM and Balboa lots, um, replacing the previously staffed Parking booths at those at those pay stations um, uh, has has been and, and it, as you can see by the acceptance, um, it is uh, the the most used of, of our parking uh, infrastructure. But consistent with the industry trends, the city has been starting to reduce our reliance on single space meters in favor of the multi space stations and the pay by app, uh, which are much more cost effective in most situations. So the problem with the uh, single space meters, um, you know, they are 10 years old. Um, they rely, the current meters that we have rely on a 2G cell service, which may, lo may no longer be supported uh, by carriers as soon as, as December 2020. So uh, we, we do need to do something quickly. Uh, there are battery issues. Um, the capacity isn't enough in those, some of those areas that don't receive enough solar recharging. Um, they, they go dead. Um, and uh, once the meter goes dead during the day, um, you know, some, uh, a parker is able to park at that space all day and we miss out on, on uh, uh, revenues when, when they go down. Um, they're also um, increasingly hard to get parts for, for, uh, for those manufacturers. And we've done our best uh, with, with glue and duct tape and scavenging parts as much as we can to keep them running. But it's, you know, be between the corrosion and, uh, you know, proximity to the beach, um, there, you know, we, we're seeing a 30% uh, failure rate on, on non-reporting uh, meters. Say, say that again. So we're seeing about a 30% uh, uh, 30% of the, the meters are um, 
failing at, a, at a, any one time. So uh, they're either not reporting, they may be co collecting um, and, and, and storing information, but they're no longer connecting to our service. So we don't know that, uh, you know, it, um, whether or not they're fully operational or not. So let's stop there for a second, because that's, that sounds like a problem. I mean, it, doesn't it? The, I mean, it, there's two problems there. One of them is that if the um, if it's not reporting, are we collecting the money? So that that's problem number one. And the problem number two is if a if an office if a parking officer is coming along trying to figure out whether someone is paid for that particular vehicle, um, if it's not if it's not reporting properly. Are, are we giving out tickets improperly? No, they, they get to park there free if it's inoperable. Um, and, uh, but it is possible that it could retain, if the battery dies, it could retain the charge, uh, retain the information, and report out uh, in, in batch mode at, 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 a, at a later time. Mm, okay. So 30% sounds alarming, but... Uh, it is a problem and it's, it's getting worse. I mean, they're, they're just, uh, I think um, our best estimate is it's, it's about half a million a year that we think we're probably losing at the, at the moment uh, towards inoperable, inoperable meters. Okay. So, well, so, so I mean, it's a problem. Yeah, hang on just a second. We got a couple, so Ms. Dixon. Well, I was just going to ask how much. Well, we could have put in two temporary bridges over PCA. <laughs> 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 or temporary staircases. Well, anyway, that was my question. That's a, that's a lot of money. So I see where we're going with this. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Herdman. Oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. So I, I just wanted to draw a quick distinction. There are two components. The, the smart meters, um, as I said, are approaching about 10 years old. And on the upper left, you can see that the, 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 the top portion is the actual meter. Uh, the, the meter housing and coin canister it, um, below, you can see the corrosion. Those are um, um, at least 20 years old, and, and they, they would need to be replaced as well. They're just in a sad state of uh, affairs. So. Uh, something that, that needs to be addressed. And so that makes it even a uh, more expensive proposition when you're meeting, replacing both the meters and the canisters. Yeah, Ms. Dixon. Okay. Um, so the one on, the image on the right with the code 9719, wasn't that Park Mobile? That, that is Park Mobile. And Park Mobile, uh, so th th that's the pay by app, and, and you can use Park mobile at any uh, at any spot in the city at any city spot in the city so okay but so that it is cross-functional that way so right. that we at least on those meters we're recovering through park mobile um, it, 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 if they choose to pay if it's non-operable oh all right <laughs> okay it's a problem okay thanks mm-hmm so uh, this is a very generalized map, um, but you could see, mo I mean, it, just from the, 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 the areas of, uh, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody, most of the single space meters are on the peninsula, uh, but they do bleed into West Newport um, at, at, at all the numbered uh, street ends uh, are also uh, serviced by pay stations. Um, and, and we do, uh, we, we could pull up GIS maps if you if if you wanted to drill down on, on, on those particular or any particular area that you had questions about. Um, so again, here's the conundrum. Option one is replacing single space meter, meters and housing, or um, option two um, would be to remove the single space meters and rely on a combination of pay stations and pay by app. And uh, the, the trade-off there is, uh, is convenience for, for um, um, you know, if you pull up in front of a meter, you know, it's, pay, pay, you know it's, a, it's an area that needs to be paid, and it's right in front of you. And, uh, but it's, it would it'll be costly to, to replace those. So the pros and cons, yeah, you know, we, we mentioned the customer convenience and familiarity. Um, it has the least amount of change to the general public. Um, 
The meters can be outfitted with sensors to get some occupancy uh, reporting. So that's one benefit of continuing with uh, uh, single space meters. And it preserves the coin payment option, although that is, it, that, that is uh, uh, decreasing as, as well. It's, um, most people either use credit card or uh, other, other options. Cons, um, it's the highest initial equipment cost and monthly transactions. Um, it also has an aesthetic effect of all the uh, public areas, cluttering, um, you, you know, so it's, it's much cleaner when you, rem you know, to, to remove those medians, uh, sorry, to remove the, uh, the single space meters. Um, and uh, s that you do have more maintenance requirements with 700 meters that you'd have to go by and either maintain or collect the coin. Um, so the cost of, of maintenance and operating them are, are, are more expensive. So the cost, um, when you look at the hardware alone, just the, me uh, so this would be meters and 11 pay stations is about uh, $1.1 million. And then o uh, over a 10 year period, uh, between the fees and the transaction costs would be another, uh, uh, almost another million dollars. And uh, because we are reducing, uh, further reducing our dependence on pay stations, uh, sorry, on single space meters, that we would have some increased signage costs uh, associated with the removal of uh, some of the single space pay station where we're replacing them with pay stations. Uh, so it's total cost of 2.1 million if we, it's, it's basically status quo with a small reduction of, I think of about 121 uh, meters uh, uh, in the original option one proposal. So option two would be removing all the single space meters and um, and option 2A would be kind of the minimum number of pay stations that we could see to, to replace uh, the 700, 700 pay stations that uh, are currently included in option one. And then if we wanted to be a little kinder, gentler, um, we could add uh, additional pay stations so that um, there, you know, uh, a customer wouldn't perhaps need to walk as far or cross the street in order to get a pay station if they had not adopted uh, pay by phone. Of course, if, if you adopt, uh, if the customer adopts uh, pay by app, there's no need to touch any of the public infrastructure. It's contactless. You just enter on your phone, you put your plate, and you're, you're off and running. And that's available now. We just need to get folks, and really that's the ultimate end game would be to get out of the hardware refresh, uh, but it does, it, it would represent a change in our service model. So you got a, f a few questions. Let me, let me start real quick. So um, on the peninsula, you know, when you go park on the interior of Balboa Boulevard on the, on the median side, there's no individual pay stations. There's no, so there's no um, meter. There's no pay station. It's Correct. just a sign that says, you know, how to how to pay for it there. I mean, it seems like people have figured out how to do that. Um, so, so those were our first trial areas. Yes, and, and how's they've it been, been going? successful. They yeah. have been successful. I mean, you do get occasionally, um, uh, uh, you know, if if you haven't set it up, it's it's might be frustrating um, at at the get go uh, to to do it on, you know, to download the app and put your credit card information. But once it's set up, it, it, it is the easiest way to pay at any of our, 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 our pay stations and highly encouraged, uh, especially in the era, era of uh, uh, COVID-19 you know, and not having to touch any of the public infrastructure. Yeah, all right, we'll start with Ms. Brenner then. So my question was, um, when you look at one versus 2A and 2B, you see that 2A and 2B both have reduced expenditures, but on one, isn't that a recurring expenditure where, like, how do they compare as far as 
time after time having to go back and spend these amounts of money? They're pretty comparable. I tried to do, do my best to strip out any of the non, or, you know, costs that were either current, recurring to date. Um, and, and, and so really this is, should be a, a, a pretty good comparison to option one and option two A or B. However, not discussed in this presentation, which would be the third option, which would be to go to Park Mobile only, would be the least expensive because, or, or at a time, perhaps you're still having pay stations, but you've decided, okay, this is the last time we are investing in pay stations or we're gonna slowly reduce that. Uh, then you can start saving less for their, their perpetual replacement. So well, this, is, this is assuming a perpetual replacement. It seems like as the years go by that you're going to be spending less on 2A and 2B than you would if you continually Absolutely. upgraded those meters. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's only a matter of time before there will only be either a handful of pay stations in the city. Um, and um, So, uh, I, I think staff's first thought pre-COVID was, okay, we'll refresh the meters one more time, but probably the last time. But now with uh, post-COVID, there um, is a, a lot of uh, a lot of articles pointing to that you know COVID really advanced e-commerce and the acceptance uh, of e-commerce uh, as as a way to do business. And so we wanted to provide council this this opportunity to consider: Do you want to make a, a an expensive short-term investment in uh, single space meters or start making baby steps to, let's say, remove the single space meters and um, have some combination of pay stations to uh, um, serve those that for whatever reason choose not to adapt, uh, adopt uh, pay by sell technology. Um. Okay, thank you. Mr. Herdman. Yeah, and I need a better understanding of the estimated monthly fees column, what that represents, what, 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 what are we paying for, uh, and what does the 10 years mean? <clears throat> so that, that those, are, those represent 10 years of month, monthly fees, and depending on the type of equipment, uh, there may be a monthly flat fee, like a, a single space pay station, uh, a single space meter. I believe it's it's somewhere in the neighborhood of eight dollars a month, and then uh, a, a cents per transaction. Um, so that is ten years worth of 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 of, of operate of, of of fees associated with uh, operating those those meters. Uh, I'm sorry, we were talking about pay stations in, in option two, so this would be of the operating month. the pay stations. Yes, yeah. operating the pay stations would be uh, the, the monthly the, the monthly uh, fee for for maintaining the pay station. Who are we paying that to? So that that goes to um, whoever the provider of the pay station is. Um, and what do they do for that? Make sure it's running. Uh, no, no, it's um, essentially part of you, you buy the equipment and it's maintaining the back end infrastructure for communicating with your network and reporting to you. So they get as part, you know, as uh, part of their service model is you, you, you have an initial cost and then a, some monthly cost based on, on volume. And if something goes wrong with a pay station, do you pay additional money to get it repaired? So or is, we it have, in, is it included in that cost? Um, so, so we have a separate service provider that does the maintenance. If there's warranty, if it's under warranty, then 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 the, uh, okay. the parts and labor are free. If it's not, then uh, we have to either you know buy additional batteries. At, at, um, and then our uh, our separate contract with Ameripark, they go out and 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 service. But servicing uh, eighty to one hundred and sixty pay stations is 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 much easier than servicing seven hundred. And estimated sign cost is a one-time expenditure. That'd be a, 
large uh, as long as those signs last. last. Yeah. yeah, which should okay. be pretty long. But you you do I, I want to acknowledge that you're going to have to add more signage to indicate you need to pay here because there's no meter that's uh, blatant in front of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Dixon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so so it's, to your point about e-commerce and just how society is moving, the, the pay station is ultimately going to be obsolete. So the only reason we're including that in this, uh, the prospect of this proposal is as a convenience, is that it, as people transition? But Correct. Uh, it, it's a bridge. It's a it's bridge. A bridge. Oh, you know, and, you know, there was speculation maybe five or seven years ago that, you know, calling for that all infrastructure would be removed within, you know, five or ten years. Well, um, that, you know, that was a while ago. That didn't quite happen, but we're, we're seeing it. And we, we um, strongly believe, and, and the numbers aren't compelling to invest in this equipment, uh, from an, from a return on investment standpoint, right. the only reason to do, to do it is to accommodate uh, those that may not readily adopt. So, uh, what would be if we d decided no no pay stations at all? Mm -hmm. What's the cost to the city? Um, really, the cost of signage um, and. Uh, uh, some cost of removal uh, of the meter poles. But you haven't presented any uh, of the operating costs. of. We just continue our contract with Park Mobile. So, so even for Park Mobile, um, and I believe our, 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 because it's such a cheaper option for, for the city, we don't have to pay for a gateway and we don't have to pay for, um, the city picks up that cost for the, for the consumer. Um, and it's about you know nine nine cents per transaction if if I remember correctly is that right? Oh, it's fifteen cents per transaction. Sorry, fifteen. But that's our only cost. We have no infrastructure, no capital costs. Correct. So what we're looking at today is, and the previous slide, how much was that if we decided to go that route? We have a cost comparison at the end uh, between. All right, the but options. so these are this is real money. Of two million dollars, a million and a half million dollars, to facilitate the transition to something that is arguably obsolete today. Correct. And so that should be part of our thought process. Um, Park Mobile. I know we've been working with them for a number of years. I mean, it, it, by relying on this technology, uh, we're protected if they go out of business or. Or there's a few technology change, for example. I mean, for example, are they keeping us current with new technology options, being able just to hold up your iPhone to... to so they're a service provider like anyone else, right. and we can choose, and then they have competitors. And they, uh, what's emerging uh, now, too, is the ability to provide multiple providers, if you like. Oh. Uh, you know, so if you, you know, if Huntington Beach chooses a different mobile service provider... Um, you know, they, 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 they could u use that. Um, but it doesn't matter in terms of, because it doesn't matter. It's just the technology that we're linked it's into. It's a service. So there's no hard cost. There's no hard capital. Absolutely. So th that's why that's the ultimate end game. Right now, you know, it's the service delivery trade-off uh, between uh, folks that may not want to walk to a pay station. Um, it's the education um, or just I, maybe I don't have a smartphone or I'm just unwilling to download the app and put my credit card information in there. So it, that's why it's, this is something we wanted to bring in front of council to say, are, are you ready to make that step? And these, I guess we have no way of knowing the, uh, what percentage of our resident population pays into a parking meter because most people who would be parking it on the street probably have an annual permit. <clears throat> That's a, a, a good point, is that if you are an owner of a um, annual permit, and especially the master permit, then you you could do, you know, that's another option is, is uh, 
avoid, perhaps you wanna, don't wanna use your phone or you don't have a cell phone, you could, you could come up to the cashier and counter and buy, buy a, a master permit and you can park at any of our state spaces legally. Um, but arguably we could, we'd be allocating a million and a half dollars for primarily visitors who are uh, visiting our city. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a cost. I mean, they're coming to our city and they're willing to pay for parking. It's just how easy are we willing to make it for okay. them? Um, kind of a, a historical question. You've been here a number of years with the city. Could you just explain for our own edification why there are parking meters predominantly on the peninsula? And that's a good thing. It's a good revenue source. And people, I don't hear any complaints except people using Parkmobile once and then they get it. So I hear nothing, no complaints. But just maybe a, more of a cultural perspective on parking meters in the city? So, so s especially in the, uh, the, the high traffic impact areas uh, where there are predominantly tourists, that is a means to uh, uh, essentially offset some of the cost of tourism to the city. Um, and it's v uh, very common to have it in, in business districts uh, a a as well to perhaps maybe limit, also line time limit uh, so you don't have beach parkers parking in front of a uh, um, a, um, um, a you know a, a, a store a retail store for you know the whole day taking up that space. Well, and the not to be left unsaid is the, the benefit to those businesses that the parking meters generate improvement dollars to improve the villages and certainly on the peninsula that is that's true that a portion not all of it it's just a very small portion of the parking revenues that come in from the visitors uh, help to replenish the community and uh, pay for ancillary services like sidewalk cleaning and signage and that type of thing so there is a benefit but what about corona del mar and why isn't th why aren't there really parking meters in corona del mar <laughs> there, there are some <laughs> <laughs> and, and corona del mar state beach uh generates oh, uh qu quite a bit um and there is a, a, a small lot uh kind of sort of behind sherman gardens uh, that that also is there but not a bad way i su I, I suggested a number of uh, years ago um uh, at the cost of you know toma rotten tomatoes being thrown at me, <laughs> but uh, sometimes you know if you want turnover in front of your business, not a bad uh, you know while everybody has a bad impression, or if you don't want them parking in front of you know your house to have have it a paid area and buy it, you know for the resident to to buy a, buy a parking pass. Brad, could I jump in ahead of you and answer that question about CDM? <laughs> um, we've been very resistant to having parking meters in Corona del Mar just because of our village feel. And, and Dan's absolutely right. Whenever the topic would come up, it would be like warfare. So what has happened during the pandemic is that the citizens who live on our residential streets and near Ocean Boulevard have been telling me stories about people who come to Corona Del Mar and are incredulous that they don't have to pay to park. It's like, I think it's even gone out on social media that you can park for free in Corona Del Mar and it's been not to our advantage that that has been happening. So at my meeting on Thursday night, which I'll be talking about later, we will be talking about the possibility of including in our residential parking program um, having paid parking at significant places in Corona del Mar. And so I think our citizens are recognizing that maybe it's something that we have to sort of come to the current century on. And But in the past, it's just been part of the charm of Corona del Mar that we had no parking meters. So, And now that we don't have to have meters, I think it might be more uh, agreeable to the citizens to think that we have paid parking without having to pollute the bluff top and other areas with the parking meters. Good. All right, thank you, Dan. Mr. Avery. All right, I've got a question then. Um, so if I'm looking at, uh, I mean, there are certain stretches along PCH, for example, 
where it'd be pretty easy to um, make sure that if someone pulls up, they can walk no more than, I don't know, 100, 200 feet to a pay station, maybe less. Um, there are other stretches where it's pretty lengthy. Um, and so when you are looking at 54 pay stations, for example, what, what were you looking at to get to that specific number um, in order to determine that was enough for people to be able to walk to if they needed to? <clears throat> so there were certain areas uh, that, that you pointed to, like along PCH in West Newport, that it really doesn't make sense to put a pay station in there for $10,000 to cover a small stretch, and there's not a lot of demand. So that area, along, like the, some of the medians in Balboa, would be targeted to say to be park mobile only, and so we wouldn't. There, there isn't enough demand uh, and concentration of spaces to warrant a a pay station. Yeah, I, I, I'll just say I think when when we when I'm looking at this and my experience on the peninsula and then my experience also in CDM state, um, you know the the beach area there where you don't have individual. You drive down in. You can either use your phone or you walk to a pay station, and it's pretty easy, and people have figured this out. Um, I'd like to go for, frankly, the uh, the least costly option on this because we've seen it work, um, and it strikes me that uh, you know even at the even at 54 pay stations, we're eventually going to phase that out completely. So um, I'd I'd like to I would probably go option 2A, but um, we'll have more discussion on that, Mr. Herdman. There. Um Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but there really is an option three, and I think Diane was pursuing that, uh, which is the elimination of parking meters, pay stations, and everything, and we go strictly to phone app. Uh, th that is absolutely true. And, and, and that would be our, our uh, what we're looking to in the future? Uh, it could be done now. It would, I would consider it sort of the nuclear option. I was trying to have a gentler, kindler customer <laughs> service uh, 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 approach, but there are cities that have totally eliminated single space meters and pay stations, and really that's the only option. Most cities have an either or, you, you, or you could choose to pay by phone, but then there are uh, scattered pay stations that for whatever reason, maybe you forget your phone, it dies, whatever, you still have the option to walk down the street and make a payment. But there are, but there are cities that, uh, mostly international, where there's neither a pay station nor uh, um, single space parking meters. And so you've got cities like uh, uh, Dallas and DC and Seattle that are, and, and San Francisco that are actively reducing the number of single space pay stations. Well, we have- uh, Sorry, yeah, single space parking meters. We had a council meeting uh, a few council meetings ago and we were talking about the effects of COVID on our on the revenue in our city and we're looking at a 33 million dollar loss of revenue and we're going to have to um, keep a careful eye on our budget and our expenditures over the next uh, year and this certainly seems like uh, an option that an option three could be implemented and and save a significant amount of money thank you yeah all right, any other questions before we go to public comment? Uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry. sorry, you're not done. Oh, well, sorry. Wasn't done, but I can, sorry, I can sorry, kind sorry. of get no. there really quick. No, 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 um, go ahead. Go ahead. So I think we talked about some of the, 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 the pros and cons. Um, they're, they're there for you if you, you want to take a look. Um, any question on this slide before I move forward? No. Um, this lays it out in a little bit more detail about the number of pay stations, but I think we talked about the di difference between um, two, 2A and 2B is just the number of pay stations. Um, funding, we do have money set aside. Uh, we plan for the perpetual replacement of equipment, so the money is already there. Um, and so it could be redeployed, and certainly when you go to the infrastructure less option, uh, that would add another three or four hundred thousand of money that we currently set aside for either the collection or the replacement of, uh, of, of single space meters that could be redeployed to other areas uh, that need, need attention in our budget. And so the cost breakdown um, is, uh, uh, it, or the cost comparison is here. Option one is 2.1. 
uh, over 10 years. Option 2A is 1.1 over 10 years. Option uh, 2B is 1.7. Uh, I, I didn't cost out what the service option or the signage option would be for the option 3, which would be to eliminate all hardware or keep the pay stations that we have in service and slowly you know, use them as long as we can. Um, so this is where I'm really kind of looking for your direction um, and, and, and perhaps uh, this would be an appropriate time to take public comment before you, uh, if I could get a straw vote at the end to give me some guidance on, on uh, where we're going. Okay. All right. Um, seeing none before we get out to uh, public comment, we'll go, we'll go to public comment on this item. Mayor O'Neill, members, members of the council, this is Jim Mosier. When we're talking about parking in the Newport Beach, we're obviously talking about an issue of coastal access. And if it weren't elsewhere, it particularly means that equity in providing access is very important. So I would like to suggest with regard to the possible nuclear option three of requiring all payments to be made through smartphones, I can testify that not everybody in the world has a smartphone. Some don't even have a cell phone. I am one of those. So I believe to provide equity, as Dan alluded to, that option, if ever considered, will need to be supplemented with some opportunity for people to purchase a parking permit in person for cash, not an annual permit, but a day permit or something like that that would allow that vehicle to park in any paid parking place in the city for some time that they pay for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Seeing none, do we have any calls? All right, let's bring it back. So um, that's, a, a, that's a fair point by Mr. Mosier that I was also gonna raise. The other thing I was gonna raise is there are, I, I'd say it's about 50-50 when I'm going to um, CDM Beach, for example. Like 50% of the time, I've got the data that'll, uh, I've got enough signal that'll pull up Park Mobile. 50% of the time, I don't. Um, so uh, I think we're not quite there as a city on the infrastructure side of, um, of cell towers. And I know that's, <laughs> I'm just gonna say, I don't, we're not there um, without touching on, on what, that, what that could potentially mean. But I'm, I'm concerned that we don't have the data bandwidth inside the city from an infrastructure standpoint to, to, to meet the, the um, demand of uh, an all cell phone based system and and mr. Mosher's right I, I'd like I'm not sure we're going to be there either yet where everyone has a phone that can can do this so we, we probably do need to stay in the parameters of what you're what you're describing here first but to the extent that um, what we're really talking about is uh, you know we've got we, we've had a fairly successful program in place already on the on the medians and I agree I, that's why I wanted to ask if we I, I assumed it was successful but it's good to hear it is and then when we're looking at you know, West Coast Highway, for example, going out um, from, you know, from Cappy's out to Frog House, um, you've got so many single um, that are so easily removed. And then with one pay station on, the, on, you know, on a block, for example, it's so easy. Um, so you know, I, I'll, um, when we do a straw poll, I'll be, I'll be going for 2A because um, it strikes me that we're at that point where most people have it, um, but for the folks who don't, we can still provide the options. Ms. Dixon. Thank you, Mayor. So just to parse uh, the options, so the 54, I think with, within 2A, the, we're talking about the acquisition purchase of new pay stations, or have you costed out, as you spoke just a moment ago, retaining, how many current pay stations do we have? 84. So, so just keeping them, why do we need to replace them? Why not save that capital cost, keep them, until, yeah. and then as they eventually die by attrition we just we could decide again whether we need to add more spend the money for new pay stations but 
they probably, what is the expected life ex expectancy of these patients? How old are they? So there are, um, the expectancy is, 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 is about 10 years, if I'm correct. Thumbs up. Seven to, ten. Se seven to 10 on the pay stations. There are 29 of the existing 84 that probably would need to be replaced in the next three to five years. Nothing, um, but the 54 would be augmented to, the, to our, our um, total uh, fleet of, uh, of pay stations to replace the 700 single space meters that are out there. So we're not replacing, we're not proposing to replace any of the existing pay stations. Okay, have you done the analysis, just the, the proximity analysis to determine where the current pay stations are that are currently exist, and, and if all the parking meters were to be removed, are, they, are the pay stations or the app a viable alternative? Yeah, so we, we've kind of dissected the city and the areas to, uh, you know, looking at the volume of transactions where it would be most, uh, if it's uh, even cost effective to put a pay station there or go directly to Park Mobile. In some cases, it, we're going Park Mobile only. And the 54 uh, was based on our, our, our outside consultants. Uh, recommendation that that was kind of the minimum uh but uh, uh tony do you do you do you want to comment on whether 54 is indeed the minimum or could we i if i get where you're going is perhaps we don't even even need to buy 54. right So we came up to the 54 number by taking a ratio of pay stations to number of spaces that they would service. So at 54 pay stations, we're looking, if I remember correctly, it's about 10 to 12 spaces that would be serviced per pay station. Um, and then that's when we, well, like Dan had mentioned, certain areas were deemed to be better for Park Mobile because of either the number of spaces and it just didn't make sense to put a pay station there or proximity and distance to a pay station. Did, okay, so let me ask this question. When you're looking at this, were you looking with the idea of trying to uh, temper people's need for going to an actual pay station and trying to change the user experience? For uh, Let me ask, I guess, another way to it. Did, you mentioned other cities, Dallas, et cetera. Did you check with cities how they made the transition? Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, we talked to a number of different consultants that help, you would help those, the, the, uh -huh. those cities. And I think the strategy that we're doing, if you remember, recall the first slide in 2011, we had 1,300. So we are slowly transitioning people away uh, from single space meters currently. Uh, but to get rid of the 700, uh, that was uh, Tony's uh, best advice for kind of maintaining the, the, the current. But if the direction is to trim that even more, we can, we can take, take a look at... Uh, uh, well, to, to Mr. Herdman's point a few minutes ago, I mean, a million dollars is a million dollars, and we have a $34 million shortfall. It's, I mean, I'd be looking... We're, we were debating a moment ago about a $200,000 temporary staircase. This... Um, and the world is going to technology. I, there's, it's not going backwards, it's going forward. So I would, in my thought process, to look in terms of designing this plan, I'm not suggesting we go to cold turkey because there are people who may not have a cell phone, but to go on a more aggressive path, uh, to not be so kind and gentle perhaps, but just be realistic and fiscally prudent that we perhaps don't need to expend a million dollars that we can communicate through communication on our website. I don't know if there is anything, and certainly not on the landing page of our website, that could say Newport Beach is going to be transitioning to an entirely web-based parking system. So please be sure that you bring your a cell phone or some companion brings a phone so you can pay for parking. Uh, we could do more to train the visitors that are coming into our city uh, and have a wonderful experience that we are go transitioning to something that most many cities have already done. I would just say, let's accelerate that process and to save the city money. Thanks.
Uh, Mr. Duffield. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have experienced this uh, in a place where I have another house in Ogden, Utah, and they went exclusively to the uh, the app, and I I really was I was so upset <laughs> for the first time. I was just mad in my car, going, "Geez, this is horrible." I, and I, so I downloaded it, I read the instructions, I put my information in, now I am, it is so easy that it's ridiculous. It knows where you are, you don't have to do anything. You just push, I mean, come on. I don't know anybody who doesn't have a cell, the whole world is staring at their phones, okay? And if you, if you don't have one, your friend has one. I mean, i am I'm been more listening to this conversation and just, let's just do it. This. What are they going to do? What, you, you can find a parking place if you don't want to pay. You can go somewhere else. But you'll, you'll know that when you come to Newport, you download the free app, and you, you use your phone. I mean, it's just too easy. And I'm an old fart. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> I don't like this stuff. And it's, it's easy. And, and, uh, yeah, but the youngest person here is a little more conservative on this, apparently. <laughs> All right, uh, Ms. Brenner. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Duffield, were you done? I apologize. OK, Ms. Brenner. I had a question about, do maps and uh, other online sources identify where there are these pay stations? If you go, like if I went to Dallas, could I look online and see where there are pay stations if I needed that service? Or is that something we could perhaps have three pay stations in town at City Hall and MacArthur and West Newport or something where it showed online if you really need to pay with cash or something, you can go, and, and would that relieve our um, liability with the Coastal Commission that we advertise that, that there is a place that people, if they needed to go, could go and pay for a day pass or whatever? So currently in our GIS system, we have every single meter uh, identified, you know, where there's a parking meter, and we have every single pay station. Uh, now it's driving people to that website. They're usually not going to the city website, but um, to say, hey, where can I park near the crab cooker? So that, that, that has been the dilemma. The information is there. It's an education process. Um, I think for Perhaps the older members of the community, I haven't spoken to Laura about this, but maybe we have uh, uh, offer a few clinics about you know, downloading apps and how to specifically do that for the tourists. It's a little bit more challenging. I think you know, it's, they're there for the first time. They'll, they would likely get a warning. Uh, we, we keep track of that, and then the next time they'd get a ticket. So Google Maps doesn't show where there are pay stations? Uh, Google Maps will show um, where there is uh, parking and what the rate is. Uh, there are some other a uh, little bit more boutique apps that even tell you what where the cheapest parking is, et cetera. But I'm not um, uh, I, I'm not aware. We could certainly reach out to Google to try to make that you know in our landmark. Uh, but I, I'd have to confer with um, our, our experts in IT on that. Okay. Um, I agree we're going to get there. I, I just am concerned about data. I, I mean, I really am. Like, I, I, I think that we've got the, we, we just don't have all of the spots in our city covered yet for enough data, uh, especially on high, high um, uh, traffic days where we've got, a lot of people on the peninsula. I mean, when you add 50,000 people onto the peninsula or more, um, with all with cell phones, uh, it starts slowing the network down. And that's one of the reasons we had a, you know, we've got an upgraded contract with Verizon and, and whatnot to kind of work through that. We're not there with Verizon yet. We're not there with AT&T. We're not there with a lot of them. So the part of the issue, in my view, is I'd love to get to this point. I really would. Um, I, I just am concerned that we would be causing some major concerns, especially with our tourism. Um, community if we just went straight mobile right now um, to the point about cost 100% I agree with you on the cost issue um, if we're looking at the potential for regaining at least a percentage of that five hundred thousand dollars by reinvesting and you know and, and putting it back into the park mobile which I my understanding is when we've got park mobile we actually end up um, 
doing pretty well on the financial finance side of that. People actually tend to um, pay more because they can access it from their phone and then just extend it out. So we seem to be doing better on that front. Um, when we have people going more mobile than than on the single single side. So even if we're able to regain you know a pretty decent percentage of that. What we're talking about on the cost expenditure side is maybe three years of um, amortization, uh, regaining that in lost revenue. So if we end up in a situation where we're regaining it over a three-year period in a realistic seven to ten-year cycle, that's not so bad on the on the finance side. That means that we're going to be regaining all that and then making more because of it in you know in the in the future cycles. So um, you know a three-year and I'm being. Um, that's a rough estimate, but if we were roughly saying a three-year amortization on a seven to ten-year cycle, that's that's pretty good. So, um, and, and then hopefully in seven years, by seven years from now, we've gotten to the point where uh, you know a data, a, a fairly even an inexpensive phone is um, fairly ubiquitous, and you've got to the point where you know you can remove out all these all these uh, structures before um, needing to them. But but at that point. I don't know. I, I, I don't. I, I just don't think we're there in terms of the data bandwidth to be able to go all digital yet. Um, we will be. We're just not there. So, I still think we ought to go back to we we ought to go to the least expensive option. Um, but I still think two A is probably where we're at. With the caveat, though, to Miss Dixon's point, with the caveat though that um, you know I'd like us to just take a you know a good pencil to that fifty four number. Um, are we sure fifty four is the right number? more, less, um, you know, take the GIS approach and just figure out, okay, so I, I understand the equation that you used on that. It makes sense to me. Now actually put them and, you know, figure out where you would put them. Um, and if, uh, if there are some spots where you could, you say, oh, you know, actually if we just put it in the middle here, it's this, e it's an equidistant for a couple blocks and that's not so bad. Or if you're looking at it and saying, oh man, we have to, we have to add more. We just need to know that. And that's okay. We just need to see that. Um, but I, I think at this point, you know, going to a scaled down approach, um, having the pay down, pay, you know, having the, having as many people transition over is great. But I think we also, we're at the point now where we still need to, we still need to have stations for people to pay. Um, all right, with that, I'll tell you what, we're gonna go uh, straw poll on one, two A, two B. And you know what, we'll throw in option three, which is the all, all mobile option also. Could we put it back on the screen so that we have um, a view on this? So we're going to start with we'll start with option one when we get it back up on the screen. Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, could we use the? The comparative option, uh, the, the where we show all three options with the yeah, cost. Yeah, whatever that... slide helps helps us um, differentiate the best would be helpful. Probably not that slide. <laughs> Operator error. <laughs> Oops, okay. One more. One yep. more. I think it is that one. No? Oh, that one. There you go. Okay. All right. So when we're looking at this, um, before I before I get there, any questions before we start on 1, 2A, and 2B? And I'm also going to include C, uh, I'm sorry, option 3, although it's not costed out. we I think we have a pretty good idea of what, that it would be less expensive than all of these options. All right. Um, so if you would like uh, to do a straw poll for option 1, go ahead and go ahead and raise your hand now. I'm sorry. Let's just briefly explain each one, Dan. So option one is. So option one uh, would be adding 11 pay stations and uh, re retaining purchasing 700 new uh, single space pay stations. Okay. Option two A uh, would be to remove all the single single space remaining single space uh, pay stations. Uh, sorry, single space meters and adding 54 pay stations in their stead. And option 2B is uh, something in between where we, uh, instead of 54, um, we're at, uh, we add an additional 80, um, 
81. Okay. So. All right. All right, so I'm going to do a straw poll now. So if you'd like to see us move forward with option one, go ahead and raise your hand. There's no one. All right, if you'd like to see option 2A move forward, please raise your hand. That would be Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Pro Tem Avery, and Council Member Brenner. Okay. If you'd like to see option 2B move forward, please raise your hand. No one. And if you'd like to see option 3 move forward, please raise your hand. That would be Council Members Dixon, Herdman, and Duffield. All right, so what that means, Dan, is <laughs> um, what? Okay. no, no, it's okay. Here, here's what it means. Um, what it means is that uh, we'll need to bring this back uh, for further discussion, showing what option three would look like, um, and uh, comparing it to option two A. So let's remove option one. Let's remove option two B from the equation. Um, let's get a uh, comparison of two A and and an option three. Um, my recommendation would be that uh, part of the discussion um, be a GIS location, uh, showing us exactly kind of where, you know, where we would, where we think this would look, where this would go. And the other um, part of the equation would probably be a discussion about two things. One is coastal, uh, and the other discussion would be data bandwidth in the city. Um, so those are the things that uh, we, we will need to have further discussion on, but that's why we have study sessions. Experience from other cities, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so if we've got other cities, especially those in coastal California, who have, um, if anyone's gone to an all, all uh, cell, then we should um, we should have a discussion. You know, we should try to do a, a comparison with what, you know, or at least hear how their experience has been going too. Mr. Mayor, could we also ask if two A can be brought down even further? Perhaps we could look at that when we come back. Yeah. That, yes. Absolutely. That's. Yeah. So, so 2A through the nuclear option, essentially. Let's, let's, call, it, let's call it option three. Okay, <laughs> option three. Just, just, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. The all digital city option. Yeah, the all digital. So uh, I should have pointed it uh, out before. Uh, Carol r r reminded me that we can't remove every single pay station because state law uh, still requires us to have a, uh, a payment option. So we might be able to get, a, I don't know what that minimum number is, uh, but we do have 80, 81 in service now, and that might be sufficient. Sure. Um, so just, just fair enough. Yeah, but we can, we can, work, we can work toward that. So I guess it's, it's really the kind of the question of um, 2A versus the lowest possible. Fair enough? Fair enough. Okay, Thank we'll bring you it so back. Much. All right, with that, um, we'll go into... Um, uh, public comments. So public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, if uh, you'd like to, we'll start in the community room. Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council. <clears throat> uh, I just, as a non-agenda comment, wanted to say that I am pleased to see that despite the council having not met for nearly a month, the city did not need see a need to put on the agenda tonight a closed session. I think that's a positive development. But regarding closed sessions, I did want to repeat the comment I made to the Aviation Committee last night, which is I hope the city will be concerned about the closed session that the Board of Supervisors apparently held today or announced that they were going to hold, which was officially to discuss the rent that they would be willing to accept for the leases for the property on which the new fixed based operators would go in connection with the general aviation improvement program at John Wayne Airport. Meeting in closed session to discuss what rent they would accept is an allowable closed session topic, but we disturbingly heard at the aviation committee last night that the true purpose of today's closed session was for the supervisors to meet together with their legal counsel and discuss their response to the city's request for op operational restraints or restrictions on the leases that they might issue. I do not believe that was a valid reason for a meeting in closed session. I believe that should have been done in open session. 
and I hope the city will express some concern to the supervisors about that. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, yeah, what up, council? Um, first off, oh, first off, my name is Chad Kroger, and uh, wow, this pandemic's still pretty crazy, huh? I mean, seriously, what is going on? Anyways, you guys look good. Tans are popping. Uh, so yeah, back when Corona first struck and got Tom Hanks, things were tough. But things got even tougher when the city committed what can only be described as an act of war against the youth. And I think you know what I'm talking about. You guys dump sand in the skate parks. It hurt. Almost as bad as when Mia Selinski dumped sand in my heart in ninth grade when she decided to go to Europe for two weeks. And um, yeah, I'm all for safety, but this is a bit rash. And let me be clear, I'm cool not shredding Crete during lockdown. I'm cool not working. I don't even have a job, but I'm not cool with sand in the skate parks. Skaters have been bullied for centuries. It's unfair. Can you imagine the city dumping sand on the tennis courts at Pelican Hill? No. <laughs> Skaters don't even have an emoji. I mean, you got one for surfers, salsa dancers, even skiers. And thankfully, the skate parks are open again, and we are psyched. But honestly, I can still hear the sound of sand crunching in my bearings. Skateboarders need restitution from the city so that we can ollie our way out of this conundrum. And there's no better person to propose this olive branch than my dog, JT. All right, go ahead. What up, council? I don't have an actual olive branch. That was a metaphor for peace. I'm a rollerblader. It's rare to see a blader and skater united for the same cause, but Chad and I learned long ago that we are stronger together. I want to push beyond the sand episode and get to a place where city officials and riders feel like they can coexist at Wahoos once again. In ancient times, a general after gaining dominion would do a ritual dance with his enemy. We need a gesture like that from the city that lets us know you hear us. That is why we are asking you, Mr. Mayor, to drop into the San Clemente Skate Park Bowl. It would send a message to riders all over that we can trust you. We can only get through things with trust. If you've never done it, don't be afraid. Just dip your shoulder, commit to the drop like you commit to civil service. Don't look down. I feel like all of America keeps looking down. Mistake. Ride it out. It'll be over in a few seconds. And if you forget all this and you brick it, we'll have the same medical team present from the Jake Brown accident. Speaking of symbolism, there is no better day for this to take place than September 4th, 2020, the day Tony Hawk Pro Skater comes out across all platforms. This speech was paid for by Activision. All right. Probably worth noting we didn't pour sand in any skate park in Newport Beach, but congratulations on your Hulu deal, gentlemen. Skate or die. There you go. All right. So uh, any other public comments in the uh, community room? All right. Any calls? All right. All right. Go ahead. This is Ho Yan Ye. Good evening. I have a comment about parking meter. I was not quick enough to get um, through this public comment session, or maybe Jim Moshi didn't speak long enough. So I also would hope the city would support 2A. The reason is actually it's not a personal reason. These days we read quite often that some families don't have internet access, so kids are having a problem, um, just different problems with um, not having the internet access. So those people, they also have the right to come to the beach. So uh, with that kind of people in mind, I think we need to have this um, pay station for a little longer until it's not a problem in the state anymore. By the similar token, it's like the handicapped access. Most people are not handicapped, but we provide this service to them. So thank you. Thank you. Any other calls? All right, we'll bring it back up. So it's 5.50 right now. Um, we're going to uh, take a recess and um, what do you think, 6.05, 6.10?
All right, we'll, we'll restart at 610. All right, thank you very much. All right, welcome back to the August 25th, 2020 regular city council meeting. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. The record will reflect that all council members are present. All right, we'll start with the invocation by Dr. Jim Terrell. Is Dr. Terrell here? Fantastic, thank you very much. So we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and stand. Thank you for letting me be here tonight. Now with me as we call forth whatever our beliefs is, our faith, our sense of oneness with life, that we join together in blessing this meeting. We bless the fact that this meeting can take place in a free country where we express and know who we are and express freely who we are. So I know that this meeting tonight is blessed because the city council, the community, the police, the firemen, the teachers, all the people who support this community move forward as one, expressing the ideas that work best for the community and working in peace and love. So I say thank you, God, for the success of this meeting already done. So I release this word into the law. The success of this meeting is already expressed, and so it is. Amen. Amen. Please join me. Please place your hands over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and liberty justice, and for, justice all. for all. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The City Council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The City Council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. All right, thank you. We'll go into City Council announcements and oral reports from City Council and committee activities. This is also t the time to um, request uh, matters on, uh, to be placed on a future agenda. Um, slightly differently, Councilmember Dixon and I talked about doing the exact same A1, which is to request a uh, resolution opposing Prop 15. Um, and so as a, a matter of joint request under A1, I just want to point that out because that's a little bit, it's, it's not, it's a little different. All right, so we'll start with the City Council announcements and oral reports from City Council and committee activities. Mr. Herdman. Most of my time over the past weeks have been spent <coughs> involved with airport issues related to the general aviation improvement program working with staff here in the city with our consultants on lease negotiations as it relates to the two new fbo operators and the one limited fbo operator uh, i attended a babel island improvement association board meeting and learned of their plans for the formation of an assessment district for the completion of undergrounding uh, the remainder of the island. Uh, I attended the uh, monthly vector control trustee board meeting. Also attended along with Diane, the uh, <coughs> board of supervisors meeting last month and made comments related to the GAIP and the award of contracts for, to the two FBO operators and the one limited FBO operator. Uh, I attended a technical departure subcommittee meeting and yesterday held the monthly aviation committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Duffield. Well, it's August, <clears throat> it's vacation time, and that's what we did. We went on vacation, so I have nothing to report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Brenner. Um, well, things didn't slow down while you were gone here, Duffy, so. Um, the CDMRA board meeting met. Um, Diane, Will, and I met with the Solid Waste Recycling Subcommittee. Um, I met with Dave Webb and Public Works and the Police Department representatives on parking strategies for Old Corona Del Mar. Um, our ad hoc short-term lodging committee met. I also met with uh, Craig Batley of Burr White Realty and Scott McFetters at Craig's office. Um, I also met with Simone Georges and some Goldenrod residents who are very concerned about construction traffic and um, 
and that led to a meeting that we're having this coming Thursday night. It's an ad hoc town hall committee uh, meeting for District 6. I believe we have a flyer for this. And this meeting is really to discuss all the conversations that have been going on about traffic issues in Corona Del Mar during since the COVID issue started. And we've got a lot of community members that have sort of self uh, mobilized into groups to talk about different issues. We've got a group that's working on um, one-way streets in the village. We've got a group that's working on residential parking program. We've got um, people that are working together to come up with a community survey so that we can find out how our community feels about these different things. And we unfortunately are continually harassing the police department about loud vehicles. I apologize for all the calls and, and everything, but people are just so upset about the loud vehicles. It seems that during this time of COVID, there's um, a feeling that people don't need to obey the laws and don't need to be concerned about any inconvenience to anyone else. And so I spoke with John Lewis this week, um, along with Diane, on some, on some noise issues in general. And John tells us we need to continue to call the police department. And um, I did have someone from West Newport call me when there was a gang of um, motorcycles starting at that end of town and saying that they're coming your way. And I thought, you know, if we could have sort of a, a watchdog groups in different areas that know when these loud vehicles start at one end of town or which direction they're going, that perhaps we could have a, a greater impact. But John assured me that we should continue to call the police on those. So we're having our town hall meeting on this topic on Thursday at five th from 5.30 to 7.30. And you can uh, register for this by going to newportbeachca.gov forward slash district six town hall. And I believe we've got quite a few people signed up and we'd like to have as many people as possible weigh in and discuss these issues so that we can gather consensus. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to follow up on the noise issue, I'd like to, A1, uh, uh, to look at ways to expand the municipal code and code enforcement program to address municipal code violations, including short-term lodging and noise complaints, and include a study on municipal code citation fees. So I'd like to A1 that item and a report on my activities during the month of August. It seems like so long ago that we haven't had a meeting, but Sheriff Barnes had uh, a really a fascinating conference. We haven't reported yeah. on this, have we? I don't think, I don't think so, because it was early August, so I don't think we have, and, and Council Member Brenner and I, I don't know, maybe others, it was, it was a virtual meeting on cybersecurity issues, and uh, I know Council Member Brenner's had this experience, I'm having this experience, and many public officials are, and this is really for public officials co-sponsored by ACCOC, about having fake Facebook and Instagram accounts created. And you had one, and I received an Instagram or a message, Facebook message, direct message from Councilwoman Brenner, which, and I knew just by saying, how are you? <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't me. <laughs> at six o'clock in the morning or something. I didn't think, and I wrote her on her, her, her email, is that you? And of course it was not. So this is becoming very common uh, in the public domain, yes, but also with public officials, people taking our public images and activities and being able, in fact, I had uh, someone um, say, well, I, I, I think they I presume they were another friend and said, well, how is city council doing? So they're kind of getting into our personal activities or our public activities for that matter. So it was very useful. It's just really a heads up because uh, these uh, are these incursions in our, into our privacy are coming from Russia, Eastern Europe and China. So we just have to be be aware. Um, did, you, did you talk about Grant Howell? I forgot. Uh, well, I, many of us attended the uh, groundbreaking at Grant Howell Park. You, if you wanted to finish and just well, your I, story. Hey, one second. It, we, we actually have a slide for it, so we'll pull it. No, no, it's okay. We'll pull it up. Go ahead. 
Okay, so we've got the Grant Held Park Rehabilitation Project is beginning fall of 2020, and we did the groundbreaking yesterday. So um, we're really excited about this project, and uh, if you'd like to look online and see what's going on there, you can go to newportbeachca.gov forward slash Grant Howald, H-O-W-A-L-D, Park, and then you can see what's going on and follow the progress. Yeah, it was, it's a, a great improvement project. Um, as Council Member Herdman mentioned, we've been spending a lot of hours on aviation, airport, general aviation issues, and uh, we both spoke at the August 11th meeting of the Board of Supervisors, and their meeting, they met, met today, and so waiting to hear any reaction to their closed session meeting or any other information we will get from Supervisor Steele. And then there was an aviation committee meeting uh, last night, and so the community is engaged and uh, hoping that we are moving forward. I know we're moving forward on the right path. We just want the Board of Supervisors to support the city of Newport Beach. So uh, write your letters to the Board of Supervisors in the next few weeks. We'll be, in fact, um, Tara uh, Finnegan's office will be, John Pope will be uh, doing a community-wide communication program uh, before the next Board of Supervisors meeting when their decisions will be made on these actions at John Wayne Airport. And then we seem to have uh, a regular weekly standing meeting on short-term lodging issues, Mr. Herdman, Ms. Brenner, and myself, and Simone. And we'll continue to be meeting to uh, come forward with uh, phase two of short-term lodging in the near future. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Yes, I would like to uh, A1 uh, support of Proposition 20. Proposition 20 is looking to correct the errors that uh, slip through the cracks through AB 109, Proposition 47, and Proposition 57. Together, these laws and propositions have uh, gutted a lot of our law enforcement tools. They've made it so that retail thefts are uh, not very um, uh, punitive in how we can respond to them. They've arguably resulted in more violent crimes that have been deemed nonviolent, which is an error that many in Sacramento uh, even admitted they overlooked when they passed all these. And so Prop 20 is a way to help clean up the books and also clean up our streets. Um, I'd also like to lodge a couple conflicts here um, on items number 9, 10, and 12. I have a conflict due to my prior employment in the wireless telecommunication industry. Uh, often there's a tale involved with when you last received uh, uh, employment due to an industry. And so th those, even though I'm not in that industry anymore, still apply uh, to me today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avery. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just gonna speak to a couple of projects uh, that are gonna occur here in the fall. And uh, the first one is the East Jetty Repair, and that's the jetty that's closest to Big Corona Beach. And it all started when um, our director of public works, uh, Dave Webb, decided to go fishing and he was walking out on the jetty and he saw that there was quite a bit of uh, slippage of the rocks and uh, some damage to the public walkway. And so uh, the uh, directive is to uh, repair the corner of the public walkway in this photo that you see here and add uh, what's known as armored stone to raise the elevation even so it's... Uh, uh, safe to walk on and uh, the, this work will take place this fall and the temporary impacts along the beach and Colonel Mar parking lot uh, may be felt by some folks everything will be barricaded as necessary of course and uh, the project may go into the winter the bigger project uh, which uh, everyone on the Harbor Commission is happy about and uh, Council Member Duffield um, championed uh, as a part of the overall dredging effort is the discrete uh, dredging of the harbor entrance and this is in partnership with the uh, Corps of Engineers who are uh, behind it all of course they do the do these kinds of projects and it's a three million dollar project it's a hundred percent federally funded and uh, it, it is an outcome of the trips uh, uh, Duffy uh, Dave and I made to and Chris Miller to DC Washington DC to try and pry some federal dollars loose. And uh, this project will dredge the entrance to uh, the authorized depths of the harbor at 20 feet at low water. 
and uh, it'll take out about 70,000 cubic yards of what Chris Miller calls clean, coarse-grained, beach-quality material. Sounds good to me. And uh, it'll be loaded. It'll be loaded into a disposal scow and towed and disposed in the nearshore zone outside the surf, just east of the Balboa Pier and down about midway towards the entrance of the jetty. So replenishing the sand on the beach with the spoils of the dredging from the harbor mouth. And the sand, the sand will just naturally wash ashore, apparently. Uh, and the status is uh, currently out to bid through the core, anticipate contract award in September, start construction in October, November, and end construction about March 2021. So this will involve a barge in the, entr in the entryway to our harbor and tugs and the rest of it. Uh, Public Works has provided outreach to the Harbor Commission and, of course, Parks, Beaches, and Recreation. The city is actively involved for smooth construction and coordination. And uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, you can contact Chris Miller at, at uh, Public Works. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll run through a few. Uh, Newport Mesa Unified School District Trustee Michelle Barto spoke to the Newport Beach um, Foundation, which was great. Uh, appreciate her time. That ACCOC uh, event with Sheriff Barnes was great. I was on there too. Yeah. So uh, if I post anything that uh, offends you, I'm sure someone else wrote it. Um, speak up Newport, uh, Sheriff Barnes and uh, Chief Lewis. Thank you, Chief, for, for doing that. Um, learned quite a bit on that one too. Uh, UC Irvine uh, has a... Um, a new clinic in Orange County over in the Fashion Island area it looks great. Um, they're spending a lot of time on uh, whole body wellness, and um, especially now that we've certainly gotten used to the phrase comorbidities, uh, we recognize the value of that even more so. And so it was uh, it was great being at their ribbon cutting. Um, I was involved with all the other mayors in Orange County, uh, creating a uh, PSA that will be run through um, OSHA, the um, School of Arts. And uh, they have these great masks that they had us, they, they gave us with our city logo on it. Um, and so it, it, should, uh, it should be very professional and it's a discussion making sure people, you know, continue to have good health um, uh, out in public. And then we talked about Grant Howald, uh, the groundbreaking there. Uh, Newport Mesa Unified School Districts started yesterday. Normally, especially with our police department, we'd be telling everyone to remember 25 miles an hour in school zones. You should probably still think about doing that, but everybody's virtual right now. So my son got to start kindergarten yesterday on Zoom, um, oh. which uh, was interesting. So um, Sherman Gardens has their uh, annual soiree coming up this weekend. Um, it will be interesting too. They are obviously doing a, a lot of protocols in place. So one hour at a time, you're only allowed to be there for one hour blocks, um, limited number of people, but uh, Sherman Gardens is one of those institutions in our community. It's worth supporting, so um, appreciate that. Uh, two quick last things. September 2nd, um, 6 p.m., we'll uh, have our Housing Element Update Advisory Committee meeting. And then starting uh, very soon, Thursday night, we're just going to be a kickoff, Newport Beach Restaurant Month. Um, so a lot of our restaurants have uh, uh, been working really hard to stay open, and um, we, uh, we ought to work just as hard to keep them open. So look for that. There are going to be some great opportunities for um, for good dining experiences. All right, so we'll move into matters which council members have asked to be placed on a future agenda. Um, this item contains uh, two, se two, two um, uh, separate points that we're going to break out. Uh, the first will be consideration of an emergency ordinance to enforce state guidance on face coverings by administrative citation. The second will be consideration of an emergency ordinance to implement a one person, one seat rule for establishments with a walk up bar. Um, so on the first item, um, which is consideration of an ordinance to enforce state guidance on face coverings by administrative citation. If you'd like to bring this back, uh, please raise your hand. So this, this, is, this is consideration of an emergency ordinance to enforce state guidance on face coverings by administrative citation. Um, so if you would like to bring this back for um, discussion under A1, please raise your hand. That's uh, Mayor Pro Tem Avery and Council Members Brenner and Herdman. Okay. 
And then the next is uh, consideration of an emergency ordinance um, to implement a one person, one seat rule for establishments with a walk up bar. If you'd like to see this, please raise your hand. That'd be Mayor Pro Tem Avery and Council Members Dixon, Brenner, and Herdman. Okay. All right, we'll move forward into public comments. Or I'm sorry, on the, we'll move forward into consent calendar. Madam Clerk. This is the time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion. Those are items 1 through 14. Public comments are also invited on consent calendar items. P speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted enacted by one motion the form listed below council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action there will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the city council votes on the motion unless members of the city council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action all right on consent calendar do we have any um, recusals or removals mr herdman mr uh, duffield miss brenner none miss dixon Number five. Removal of number five. Okay. Um, Mr. Muldoon. Yeah, my apologies. I misspoke earlier. The conflicts I have that I stated prior were nine, 10, and 12. And that was based on prior employment in the telecommunication industry. Okay. Mr. Avery. None. And I have none. Uh, Mr. Avery, would you like to make the motion? I would, Mr. Mayor. I move the balance of consent, consent calendar items 1 through 14, with the exceptions of items 5, pulled by Council Member Dixon, and re, with recusals from Council Member Muldoon on items 9, 10, and 12. And we have amendments on item 1, the minutes. All right. We'll go out to, oh, I'm sorry, do I have a second on that? Yes, second. Second by Mr. Muldoon. All right, we'll go out to uh, public comment on this. Do we have any public comment on the uh, consent calendar? Okay, seeing none, we'll, uh, okay, we'll go to the phones. Hi, go ahead. The U.S. 2005 decision, City of Palos Verdes, states, quote, when utilizing the term functionally equivalent services, the conferees are referring only to personal wireless service facilities. The conferees also intend that the phrase functionally equivalent services will provide localities the flexibility to treat facilities that create different visual aesthetic or safety concerns differently to the extent permitted under generally applicable zoning requirements. For example, the conferees do not intend that if a state or local government grants a permit a commercial district, it must also grant a permit for the competitor's fixed foot tower in a residential district. This is about public safety. You Sorry, which which item are you speaking to? You know, the wireless industry. Which, all your Hi, which item are you, are you speaking to? not construct small cells in residential zones, full stop. Is this a recording? Hi, what, what item are, we, are you speaking to? I think that was a recording. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, we'll cut that one off. Okay, all right, we'll bring it back up. We have a motion and a second, any discussion? All right, let's vote. Oh, I have to, do I raise my Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance titles for items three and four, ordinance number 2020-18, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach, amending a development agreement between the City of Newport Beach and Hogue Memorial Hospital Presbyterian, and ordinance number 2020-19, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach, adopting code amendment number CA 2019-001 to amend Title 20, Planning and Zoning of the Newport Beach Municipal Code, correcting and clarifying provisions related to overlays and public hearings notice requirements the motion carries unanimously 7-0 okay all right item number five has been pulled by miss Dixon miss Dixon go ahead well thank you mayor uh, it gives me great pleasure to have uh, initiated with full support of our council members I presume when we <coughs> vote on this uh, a resolution uh, to support the Newport Beach Police Department. So if you'll indulge me, I'd like to make a few comments and, and state the resolution. Whereas the existence of law and order in any community most often results from a collaboration between the residents of that community and its law enforcement officers. 
and recent national events have brought attention to the profession of law enforcement and the men and women who dedicate themselves and their families to this profession. And the right to freedom of speech and peaceful protest must be protected, and we as a community have witnessed how some national events have given way to violence, destruction of property, and an abandonment of community values and collaboration. And the Newport Beach Police Department employs a workforce comprised of highly trained and educated individuals who are committed to excellence and have the highest standards of ethics. Whereas on June 3, 2020, the Newport Beach Police Department was faced with five separate protests at five separate locations in the city of Newport Beach, totaling approximately 2,500 protesters. To conclude the 12-hour day, whereas to conclude the 12-hour day without any major incidents, property damage, or injuries to officers or protesters is a demonstration of the Newport Beach Police Department's exceptional professionalism, preparation, and planning. And whereas the fashion in which the Newport Beach Police Department maintained order and provided a safe environment for all participants is a testament to their commitment to community's need, community needs, desires, and values, and further embodies how the Newport Beach Police Department continues to be an extension and reflection of those they so proudly serve. Now, therefore, the city of Newport Beach resolves and does hereby express support for the members of the Newport Beach Police Department in their efforts to, to connect with the community and create a safe environment for all people who reside, work, or play in the city of Newport Beach. And the recitals that we will be voting on shortly will uh, memorialize that in, in the resolutions of the city of Newport Beach. I want to uh, say how important it is, as I've just read, for the city to say this and for all of us know that how important our police department is. I mean, we've all heard comments that residents will say this is the only city they know where they can wave and get a wave back from our police. Our, our community knows our police officers. They know them by name and they feel comfortable enough uh, to call the police chief at all hours of the day or night or text him because they know they could reach, uh, reach someone in the police department and uh, record their concerns. I want to thank Chief Lewis for your leadership and commitment to keeping our city safe and to recognize the women and men in blue, I always never know if it's blue or black, but I think they're navy blue, who serve our city and our 87,000 residents and 10 million visitors with world-class service. Year to date, and the mayor cited some data a few months ago when we were discussing COVID, but just to give some data, year to date, computer-aided dispatch calls, calls that come into dispatch, and the non-emergency number, 64,644 people are calling our police department in our little city. 911 calls, 28,602. Priority, here, these are world-setting response times. Priority one response time, two minutes and 51 seconds. That is incredible. I like to see what New York is doing these days. The 911 call, calls are 99.6% uh, 99, 99 of our 911 calls are answered within 15 seconds, and 98.44% are answered within 10 seconds. I think that is a national record. And as I said in the resolution, we are all aware of the civil unrest and more taking place in cities every day across our country. Our police department exemplifies the very best in community policing. So I want to thank the officers who are here for, and for, to your colleagues. Thank you for your service and that of the 148 sworn officers, 84 non-sworn officers, 27 part-time personnel, and 53 volunteers who all make up our new, our very fine, the fine, the finest of the fine of our Newport Beach Police Department. Thank you for keeping our community peaceful and safe. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. I would just like to add that um, your service has been so much more far reaching than just the protests, that we have had mass baptisms on our beaches, we've had bioluminescence events that 
were advertised on social media where people were crowding our beaches at midnight. We've had so many different things going on during just the last few months, and you always rise to the occasion and you treat everyone with such respect and dignity. And we really appreciate that. And when when the defund police movement started, it was such a pleasure for us to be able to answer those emails that we got generally from people far away saying we don't need to defund our police because our police do so much more than just deal with criminals. They do so many far-reaching events into the community that, that benefits everyone. It's not just about policing. It truly is community policing, and you guys set the bar for that, and we are so proud of you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank um, Councilman Dixon for this considerate item. Obviously, uh, we all support it. We all support you. And uh, it's, it's great to have you be the representatives of the city because it's, someone's more likely to come in contact with you, even if they're not breaking the law, than they are any of the seven of us here. I think I know uh, Councilman Brenner was at one of the events at least. I made it to either three or four of the events that day. And I, I don't know the, the, the stress that you could feel from the residents and the, those who were assembling uh, was, was so intense in the logistics and the calm professional demeanor and uh, the, um, the approachable um, philosophy that the chief and his, and his team took uh, really, I think, elevated Newport Beach. I'd show that we're a city of law and order, but we're also a city of compassion and we respect um, c civil uh, liberties and, and law and, as I said, um, the public safety. So I just want to thank you. Um, it probably was the most stressful day in, since I've been elected to city council. Um, I know uh, people asking for curfew to be called and people were, were generally afraid, but I imagine it was even more so for you ladies and gentlemen in the back and everyone else you serve with. So thank you so much for, um, for all you do and for uh, meeting the task. Thank you. Mr. Avery. Yeah. Um, I concur with all the remarks, of course, and I'd just like to say I'm so continually impressed with the professionalism, and I, I'm trying to think of what it was, and I think it's the intelligence, uh, the social intelligence, <clears throat> the human intelligence in dealing with people and de-escalating and stepping up when it's required, but knowing when to just kind of hold back, and I, I just think that's something that is so lacking in so many places today. And I know where it comes from. It comes from great hiring and great training. You start out with great people, and you train, 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 and you keep working at it to get better. And there's always a, a challenge around the corner that needs to be met every day for you guys. And I, I'm, just, I'm just honored to be on council with a police force like this. Thank you. Thank you. And then... Quickly wrapping up, I'll just say one of the first major events that got canceled this year was the police appreciation breakfast. Um, and uh, I, I missed giving that speech. Um, I actually had it written and was genuinely excited to give it because of all the things that we've been saying right now. Little did we know how much our community would show their support and appreciation over the last certainly few months, um, whether it was a half page, then a full page ad uh, in the daily pilot, whether it's signs that have gone up across the uh, city uh, thanking you for your service, whether it's all the, the different ways people have thanked you as they've driven past. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is a small thank you on behalf of the city council for all of the work that you've provided, but you know darn well that there are thousands of voices saying thank you out in the community too. So uh, with that, uh, we'll go out to public comment first and then we'll uh, bring this back for a vote. Do we have any public comment in the community room on this? All right, seeing none, do we have any? No? All right, uh, since, it's your, since you asked for it, Ms. Dixon, I'll go ahead. I'll make the motion to support the resolution. Seconded by Mr. Muldoon. Um, any discussion? Okay, let's go ahead and vote. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on into uh, public comments on non-agenda items. We'll uh, start first in the community room. Uh, 
Uh, what up, council? My name is Chad Kroger. First off, wow, this pandemic is still pretty crazy, huh? I mean, seriously, what is going on? Anyways, you guys look good. Tans are popping. Nice. Yeah, so back when Corona first struck and got Tom Hanks, things were tough. But things got even tougher when the city committed what can only be described as an act of war against the youth. And I think you know what I'm talking about. You guys dumped sand in the skate park. It hurt. Almost as bad as when Mia Selinski dumped sand in my heart in ninth grade when she decided to go to Europe for two weeks. And I'm all for safety, but this is a bit rash. And let me be clear, I'm cool not shredding Crete during lockdown. I'm cool not working. I don't even have a job. But I am not cool with sand in the skate parks. We don't have a skateboard. Skaters have been bullied for centuries. It's unfair. Can you imagine the city dumping sand on the tennis courts at Pelican Hill? No. Skaters don't even have an emoji. I mean, you got one for surfers, salsa dancers, even skiers. And thankfully, the skate park's open again, and we are psyched. But I can still hear the sound of sand crunching in my bearings. Skateboarders need restitution from the city so that we can ollie our way out of this conundrum. And there's no better person to propose this olive branch than my dog, JT. Yeah, just to quickly remind you of the same thing during study session. What up, council? Hang, hang on. I don't hang, have an actual on, olive branch. On, that was a metaphor for peace. Hang on. I I'm a rollerblader. It's rare to see a skater and blader Cut united for, for the second, same please. cause, but Chad and I discovered long ago that we are... Sh okay. So we're gonna come back to the public comment, but I just wanna say real quickly before, as we said during public comment in the study session, city of Newport Beach does not actually have a skate park and we did not put any sand in anything. The picture that has been shown is a different city. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and start that public comment again, but just for future reference, public comments, um, you need to wait until you know I actually recognize the next speaker. So on that, I, it's worth just noting that we do not have a skate park. We did not dump any sand in anything. So anyway, all right, we'll go to the next, uh, we'll go to the next speaker now. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry I started too quickly, but Mayor, we still think that you can serve as an ambassador for the rider and city official community. That is why we are asking you, Mr. Mayor, to drop into the San Clemente Skate Park Bowl. It would be a huge message to riders all over that we can trust you. Don't be afraid, just dip your shoulder, commit to the drop like you commit to civil service, ride it out, it'll be over in a few seconds. If you brick it, we'll have the same medical team there from the Jake Brown accident. And there is no more symbolic date for this to happen than September 4th, 2020. The day Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 comes out on multiple platforms. This speech was paid for by Activision. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, on a slightly different subject, uh, this is Jim Mosher. <laughs> this comment was originally intended for the Planning Commission, but there Meetings have been canceled recently, and it's equally relevant to you. You may recall that there is an application pending to build a private parking structure in the Mariner's Mile area at the corner of Riverside Avenue and Avon. That proposal was approved by the Planning Commission. It was appealed to you, and then your decision was appealed to the California Coastal Commission. Throughout that process, the decision makers hear from folks who are in favor of the project, they hear from folks who are opposed to the project, and while the matter is before the city, they also hear from the city staff, who the decision makers, whether they're the planning commission or you, rely on to be neutral, unbiased advisors who are evaluating the proposal as professionals informing you as to their professional opinion as to how it conforms or does not conform to the city's adopted standards. 
what came as a surprise to me, and perhaps it should not be a surprise, since a similar thing happened to me in a matter I was involved with, when, when this parking structure proposal came to the Coastal Commission a couple of weeks ago for their decision as to whether it raised issues, a substantial issue with the Coastal Act or not, city staff apparently unsolicited submitted a five-page letter with attachments advocating for the applicant, asking for the appeal to be denied. It seems to me that when the matter leaves the city, it's no longer the city staff's business, and it's really hard for the public to think and see our staff as neutral, objective observers when they take a side in an issue so clearly as they did in that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other public speakers? All right, do we have any calls? All right. Hi, go ahead. Hi, thank you for the time today. I attest and affirm the following statements are true, accurate, and within my personal knowledge. Thank you. There was a game-changing ruling on August 12, 2020, in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals regarding FCC 18-133. That's the FCC order for streamlining small cell deployment. On August 12th, the Ninth Circuit judges wrote, quote, Congress prohibited unreasonable discrimination but permitted state and local governments to differentiate in the regulation of functionally equivalent providers with very different physical infrastructure. Those would be small cells. We therefore hold that the FCC's requirements in the small cell order that, quote, aesthetic regulations be no more burdensome than regulations applied to other infrastructure deployment is contrary to the controlling statutory provision. They also continued, we also hold that the FCC's requirement that all aesthetic regulations be, quote, objective, end quote, is not adequately explained and is therefore arbitrary and capricious. This is very important. We need to unpack this. This means the city of Newport Beach, under the cooperative federalism scheme that was set up by the 1996 Telecommunications Act, is a full player in local regulations over so-called small cell wireless telecommunications facilities, including the operations of these WTS. That means the effect of radiated power. Here's the problem. If you have a properly sighted macro tower, 2,500 feet away from people, with 200 antennas 200 feet in the air, when the signal gets to a bedroom, it's enough for five bars on a cell phone. That's .0. 0 to radiation units. However, when you put a small cell 50 feet outside of someone's home and turn it on, in that bedroom is now 50,000 radiation units. Folks, that's 25 million times higher. That is a matter of public safety. You have to understand you own this as the city council. So we have a conference report from the 1996 TCA which says specifically that the conferees do not intend if a state or local government grants a permit in a commercial district, it must also grant a permit for the competitor's 50-foot towers in a residential district. This is about public safety. You all own public safety. Neither the FCC nor the wireless industry own it. It's all yours. The congressional intent of the 1996 TCA was to not construct small cells in residential zones. Full stop. Wireline broadband by copper, coaxial, or fiber optic cable is not a functionally equivalent service to any wireless service, either wireless telecommunications service, that means phone calls, or wireless information service, that's internet right. gaming or video streaming. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please. Hi, go ahead. 
Hi, this is Scott Carpenter, owner of iTrip Vacations in Newport Beach. We're a short-term property management company. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, Council. Uh, thank you for your service, and very proud to have seen you pass uh, the uh, support for the police department. I'm speaking today on the emergency ordinance on short-term rentals. Uh, now that the state has removed Orange County from the watch list and we are on a glide path of seeing businesses reopen, I'd like to see the Council on the next agenda uh, go back and review the emergency ordinance and consider lifting the moratorium on issuing new short-term rental permits as we are now getting into the, the shortest part of the season. And there are families that are certainly anxious to get on with doing certain things with their properties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other callers? All right, we're going to bring it back up here. So we'll go into public hearings. Start with item number 15, um, ordinance number 2020-20, non-exclusive commercial solid waste franchises. Um, unless council would like a uh, staff report, we'll forego. All right, any questions or comments? It's fairly straightforward. All right, we'll go into uh, public comments on this. Do we have any public comments on item number 15? Any calls? All right, we'll bring it back. I'm gonna move staff recommendation. I'll second it. Seconded by Mr. Avery. Um, any discussion on this item? All right, let's go ahead and vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2020-20, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach granting the 2020 non-exclusive franchise agreements for commercial solid waste and vertebral materials handling services within the City of Newport Beach. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, moving to item number 16. Um, I had a couple of questions on this, so Simone, you're gonna handle this one. Um, I had two questions. The first question was, um, why only wine? Uh, uh, there's a lot of beer tasting rooms out there too. Um, and then the second question I had was, do we have a slide or anything showing us what a map would look like? So basically, if we got to the point where, I'd just like to see what it would look like if we had the 500 feet away from schools, which buildings in that area would actually be viable for, for this? Certainly. So, um, Simone Georges, Community Development Director. Um, why wine? When we came to the council, the city council has to initiate the code change, and so we only specified just wine. We wanted to limit it as much as possible, hence we didn't include anything else. And so we do have the PowerPoint, if we can go ahead and put that up, and we, I think we do have that slide here. If we could just go ahead and launch that. All right. We got the industrial zone here, it's circled, and I still have some more slide so right there is showing the 500 foot separation from the school in the industrial zone and let me go to the next slide here and that slide there those colored buildings show buildings that are not within the 500 foot and you could see that blue dashed line that's the border between the city of newport beach and costa mesa so Again, we don't we can't affect Costa Mesa. So those red buildings are not within the 500 foot radius from the school property line. You see in the middle of the page that star there. That is the OC winery location. Just for as a reference. So um, when we're looking. When we're looking at the uh, dashed line, just to be clear, there aren't any schools for in the co on the Costa Mesa side that would be within 500 feet. I don't think so, but I just uh, I'm not familiar. Let me. No, we don't. There's there's no knowledge of a school. Okay. All right. Um, is it? Would it be possible if I if I wanted to offer friendly amendment into this to um, you know to include a, a beer just beer tasting as well, not a brewery to be clear, like not brewing beer on site, same thing. Is that, would that be feasible tonight or is that something that we would have to do a different code initiation on? No, I think we can go ahead and do that this evening. Okay, well, it's- No, you can't add it? Okay. <laughs> so the city attorney says, nope. No, he's not, no, not even close. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, we, we, you know, we can bring it back. All right, okay, it's worth asking. All right, Ms. Dixon. Right. Um, so let me. So long as you put this illustration up, is that these are the potential 
facilities or physical structures that if wanted to have a wine tasting facility, they could? Yes. Okay. Question number two. Has this ever been considered holistically in a general plan process? No, not in a general plan process. The council has considered um, alcohol use in the industrial zone on two different occasions, and the council wasn't supportive in the past. And through, through a zoning code amendment, I'm sorry. And unanimously rejected? Cor correct. You know, last time we came back was, I think, two years ago when the, the council rejected that. Has, has there been any, um, similar to a general plan process, any uh, in into this community, community discussions, similar to how what we heard from the community two years ago when we opposed this same proposal. Has there been any discussion in the community of what they wanted to see in this area? Or is this being, yes or no? No. Uh, is this matter being brought forward by a single entity? Um, the, the OC winery is out of compliance. They're, they're operating as a retail establishment, and they're supposed to be operating as a manufacturing establishment. How long have they been out of compliance? They've been out of compliance Quite a long time. We've known about it for about maybe a year and a half. Why have we allowed it to be out of compliance? Well, we have suspended um, enforcement action pending this code change. If the council is supportive of this code change, then they would submit an application for a CUP and go through the entitlement process. If the council is not supportive of this item this evening, then we would continue with our enforcement and um, ensure that they either evict the premises or change their use back to manufacturing. When I visited this site at the time two years ago, or maybe it was 18 months ago, it wasn't that long ago, when we were considering virtually the same issue, um, I was, visited the site and understood that, and they understood, the tenant, it's, he's not the property owner, but the tenant understood that he was operating without a permit and that he was hoping for the uh, favorable disposition of the city, and that's why I went there to, and I recommended that we be lenient with him as far as enforcement while they are searching for another location. Did they search for another location? You know, I, I've gotten mixed messages that they've, I have heard that they may have found a location in Costa Mesa. Um, I believe that they could not find a location in Newport Beach because it's just too expensive to rent square footage. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that they had found a location in Costa Mesa and they're waiting on tonight's action. All right. So with the Planning Commission's uh, decision uh, a few weeks ago on this item, uh, staff had recommended, if I understand this correctly, 500 foot separation between potential businesses offering similar wine tasting offerings. Uh, and they removed the 500 foot. So what is the consequence of that? So that all these buildings could now become in the industrial zone, that zone for industrial commercial uses could be a wine or potentially beer locations. H has this been studied in terms of the impact on the nearby area or is this what we want to do in our general plan and the overall visioning process for the city? Has this come out when we started to do the general plan update a few months ago, we had to suspend because of the housing element issue and COVID. Uh, did this come out where there's a demand in the community to have wine and beer tasting in this part of the city? You know, we've received some public comment letters for this evening, but as far as through the general plan process, this item was not discussed and no thoughts about allowing alcohol service um, in this industrial zone has been provided from the community. We just had public comments in support of this okay. item for tonight. All right, well, thank you. I'll just continue to speak, though, but thank you for answering those questions. I will um, be listening to the public comment. I've read the letters. I will just say up front, this is an easy decision for me personally. While I think a wine tasting facility on the peninsula where there, it's properly zoned would be an ideal addition, and I would commend it and support it, I will not tonight be supporting uh, uh, putting this, the effect, the impact, the, the slippery slope impact that one, this one site will have potentially in this entire area without having studied this, to study the potential impact, our action alone will affect the property values of all these affected areas overnight. Suddenly they have the potential to be zoned for wine and beer or, and Mark my words, since this is public record, I bet within a year after it will be beer, and then it will be a full ABC license request that is going to come forward. So be, my caution is, before we go headlong into 
uh, making significant changes to an area of our city that has not been studied for 15 years since the last general plan, at which time this city was designated industrial usage, and every virtually every physical structure here is a school or an industrial use that we are single-handedly, single unilaterally uh, acting like the general plan update committee and deciding that this is suddenly now a beer and wine location. I think it's a slippery slope. I think it's uh, the wrong thing to do in this location until it is studied and the community has an opportunity to uh, react to this. And and to have a point of view. I also know that Costa Mesa has bars just a block away, and I could just see this being an intense area. Let me just ask you one more question since you're still standing. Since we could look at the prospect for intensification of alcohol use, has the police department weighed in on a recommendation on this? No, this is just a land use decision by the council. They so this has broader implications than a single entity. And I, my recommendation tonight would be that we defer this until the general plan update committee considers this use. I think this area has potential for a lot of different things, but tonight is not the night to do a piecemeal amendment to our general plan and affect all the property values in this area without uh, fully studying this. So thank you, Mr. Churches, I appreciate it, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Avery. Yeah, this is in my district and um, so, uh, I've been out there and, and I, uh, I gotta say, it, it's disappointing on how it kind of got started with someone, you know, and I get, I, I'm all support for business, but there's also kind of playing by the rules. And so, you know, it kind of morphed as it went along and pretty soon it's, a, they've got, they're serving some food and they're serving drinks and, you know, it's sort of a bad start. And, and I think maybe we led them along a little bit through this process, kind of trying to figure out what we're going to do with this because again we're 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 a city that wants to help small business and we get where they're coming from um but this is a tough way to start um these kinds of zones have been really successful in certain cities i think anaheim i know santa barbara has what they call the funk zone and it sort of just took an area that was sort of blighted and just sort of brought it around and brought in some really cool restaurants and breweries and wine tasting, not beer tasting rather. Um, and it's all good. And this might be the right spot for it, but it, at the very, we, we had really need to look at it. And I don't even know in terms of zoning, you know, if you're a property owner and it's going to get rezoned, would you rather have it rezoned, you know, five story residential, like so much of it? Um, and so I, I don't know if I'd be happy if I was a property owner and it got rezoned in this fashion. So it, you know, there's a lot to do here. So, you know, I know the general plan is, is for these guys a long way off. I don't know what we do here, uh, but I absolutely think this should be studied and figured out before we sort of give the green light to all these pink squares to light off as, um, uh, beer and wine tasting rooms and um, we need to you know we carefully manage the, gro the growth to the extent that we can in this city put a lot of effort into it so to let this just roll out um, without study is I think problematic thank you Miss Brenner um, Simone so what I think I'm hearing is there was no outreach to the other businesses around here or to any of the lofts and the homes in this general area asking for any feedback from any of them about this? No, we, we don't do it. We didn't do the outreach on this. So, I, I mean, I, I'm torn on this because I actually love the idea of having eating and drinking establishments that you can walk to from your home and walk back home and not get in the car. My district's kind of a poster child for that, and it works really well, but this seems to be a piecemeal approach, and I'm really opposed to us rewarding people who break our laws and, and defy our ordinances. Like, should we be encouraging that? Isn't that just something where we're asking for more people to do that in the future if we reward them for not abiding by the rules that everybody else is abiding by? So I would like to see this studied as far as how it could be sort of revitalized and maybe made a, a nice um, area that the residents in the surrounding area could walk to. But 
I don't think we can do it tonight in just this this one vote. And but I would like to. Do we have to wait all the way until the the general plan is revised, or is there another process that we could go through that would study this in more detail and really do it the right way? Right now, the only process I do have is through the general plan update process. It's just, it's a matter of resources. Yeah. You know, if council wants us to make this a priority, then we'll come back for direction to make this a priority. That just, that was just a general question. I'm not giving you, <laughs> certainly not my direction. It would be Brad that would have to decide if, if that was something we wanted to move to the front of the line or to make that case. But I just think that this is not the right way for us to do it. All right, Mr. Muldoon. I'm so sad to see this conversation go that the wine glass is half empty rather than half full. This is an excellent thing for this neighborhood. If we don't increase the property values, which this would do because we're adding additional use to these properties, we can see that this one day will become more and more housing, which I support additional housing. Sacramento gives it to us, but we don't need everything to be uh, more housing. This particular instance, we're talking about saving a business. As governments up and down the state and our own governor are constantly shutting down businesses selfishly, thinking nothing of free people and their ability to operate a business, I think we have an opportunity to save a business. Uh, I hope they get that Costa Mesa property if, if they can make this work. And I don't know what those employees will do between the time when they do tenant improvements and get their liquor license there and, and get opening. But you know, I was elected not to impede businesses and certainly not to be um, a micromanager of free enterprise. Uh, I think that people are looking at this very myopically. Um, from a big picture standpoint, I agree with the mayor. Uh, we should have beer here as well. Um, I, I know other people have reached out and, and they want to do something uh, like this. It likely would be done in the general plan and, and, and they understand that. Uh, but you know, we don't have to have, we don't have to control every use so that the only inevitable option is more housing. We can allow these people who are business people flexibility and to have other uses that uh, this case would operate outside of school hours, outside of the school zone, and with the support of the community. I received, I think, almost 30 emails supporting this. I received not a single email or a complaint against this. Um, uh, I really hope we don't shut down this business tonight. All right. Uh, any discussion, more discussion before we go to public comment? Okay. Thank you, Simone. We'll go out to public comment now. So we'll start in the community room. Any public comment on this? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, I hope, my name is Philip Greer. I'm an attorney for um, the applicant. Um, I hope I get a couple extra minutes because there's been a lot of information that's been thrown out that is just incorrect. Um, first, we are not asking for beer and wine. We are simply asking for a continuation of a wine tasting operation that has been in effect for approximately 10 years. Second, there has been no breach on our part. We started out with a small two unit facility over there and it was grandfathered in essentially. The zoning changed and we had no idea. Nobody came out, the city finally came out and they worked out an agreement with us that we could get in compliance. We then realized that by expanding, uh, we would need to have additional compliance and we have been working with the city. Currently, the business is closed because we are not in compliance until we either get these zonings and then we get a CUP. So again, this is also not granting use of this property for this purpose. It is simply allowing for a zoning change to allow for any entity, not just Orange Coast Winery, but for any entity to come in and file for a CUP and go through that process, which also involves community research, community outreach, and all the other things that are necessary before that continue, conditional use permit is used and issued and viable. Um, there is no current location in Costa Mesa. There is no significant change in what is going on over there. The zoning would allow for the property to be used from approximately 5 p.m. 
till 11 p.m. on weekdays and noon till 11 p.m. on weekends. It will not be impacting either businesses over there or any, um, any schools or any families or any operations. Um, whatever outreach the city did, they did um, in going through the zoning process. We have also done community outreach, and as, the, as Mr. Muldoon said, over 30 people have written letters in support of this project. Two of those letters came from um, Mario Makovo and Jim Walker, two very well-known, very significant restaurateurs in the community who believe that this is a viable project and that the zoning should be, be allowed. We are not serving food and we are not serving drinks. There is no kitchen, there is no kitchen allowed. If you look at the regulations, the zoning, these, okay, I'm getting feedback now, so. Anyway, if you look at the regulations, the regulations require no food service. There's no kitchen there. We are not selling food. We don't want to sell beer. We don't want to sell hard liquor. We don't want to sell anything other than some retail wine from a specific winery. You have to understand what the ABC has said is that the relationship we have with the single winery in Temecula allows us through the ABC to provide samples and then retail. And that's all we're doing. Nobody is showing different kinds of wine. Nobody's showing different kinds of beer. It's not a beer house. None of that. We're essentially looking at a modification of a definition. There is already allowed commercial activity there. There is already allowed food and drink there. We are simply expanding that to include wine. We, again, we are not expanding it to include anything else. Parking is more than adequate. If we wait on this project for three years, as Mr. Muldoon says, these people will be out of business. And I don't think in this time when restaurants are hurting, when people are looking for entertainment, when the city is looking for revenues, to put a business that wants to come in, wants to work with the community, has demonstrated that. The planning people have been out, we've walked the project site with them, we've interacted with them, and come up with what we believe is a reasonable zoning parameter for this thing to happen. And finally, as um, Mr. Muldoon again stated, this will enhance the growth of that area. It will uh, provide an alternative, it will provide an increase in property values, and it will be very beneficial for the city. Uh, as the representative, I'm here if you have any questions. Otherwise, I hope you will consider this and I hope you will vote for it. All right, thank you. We'll go to the next speaker. Mayor O'Neill, members of the council, this is Jim Mosier. I agree with council member Dixon and I actually do not understand how this got through the planning commission. To be clear, the matter before you tonight is not a request for a general plan amendment, no matter how that general plan amendment is done, but it's for a zoning change. And the fact that the city initiated a general plan update last year indicates the city still feels that our general plan means something. The general plan is the vision for our city. It's not like we don't have one. We have a very clear general plan currently. This area was carefully studied. It was given this designation of general industrial expressly to reserve an area of our city for industrial and light commercial uses and what are called ancillary commercial and office uses that support those manufacturing and research operations. There is, a there is narrative explaining that in our general plan, if you bother to read it. There are goals and policies supporting that. One of them, one of those goals, goal land use element 6.7, 
specifically says that this area with the IG designation is intended as a place to provide opportunities for needed uses that cannot be accommodated elsewhere in Newport Beach. We want the industrial manufacturing to be concentrated here. That is our vision. It's for uses that cannot be accommodated elsewhere. A wine tasting operation clearly could be accommodated in many other areas of the city. And as I tried to explain to the Planning Commission, and we'll try to explain to you, if you went forward with this zoning change, which is totally incompatible with the current general plan and therefore not even possible, but if you did it, specifying that this is the zone where wine tasting facilities should be means they cannot then be legally approved anywhere else in the city. Totally contrary, common sense, or to our general plan. I just simply cannot see how this could be approved at the present time without changing the general plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, uh, City Council. Um, thank you for having me here this evening. Uh, I can't, is the speaker working? Okay, it is, yep. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I'm truly in support of, of having a wine tasting uh, facility there. I am a business operator in the area. Um, I'm off of Monrovia Avenue. Um, we are in the, a, uh, the company's toes on the nose. We're right um, uh, in mid, right next to um, Coastline Community College there. But what I want to speak to primarily is that this area is really unique. It's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to do something special. It's a great place to work, a great place to live. There's coffee shops, there's schools, there's businesses that have been there a long time. We've been there 20 years. Um, and I've seen it change, and I've seen it change for the better. And I like what I hear from um, you know, operations coming in. I've seen what you know, Common Room Roasters is doing. I've seen what the other uh, coffee shop is doing. I've seen what um, you know, having Pacifica come in there and, and the vibrancy that they've put in the, uh, the high school there. And it's, it's a neat area. It's a unique fabrication of like what Newport Beach can be and what other cities can, can do and what they've done in, in coastal areas. And it's like, I think it would be a real shame not to like open our eyes to what this what cities are seeing out there and what they're having success in and what what the population and, and the community really wants i can tell you that i've talked to a, a lot of my neighbors i've done my own outreach and they're all in favor of it and um you know i can tell you this is an important thing for us to change and adjust to what the community wants people are walking to eat, they're walking to have their coffee. They're, you know, go. They're jumping on their bikes and they're going to the beach. I mean, this is truly something, an opportunity that we need to jump on and to put businesses, you know, over another hurdle. Um, in in trying to operate there, it's not something that we need today. We need to be a business environment up there, and this is truly a unique area that can thrive under this type of thing. And it's like, you know, like I said, I've been there 20 years, and it's like. You know, I've got a 16-year-old daughter that, you know, who knows what she'll want to do with, uh, with our building in, in 10 years or five years or, you know, when, when, you know, there's other businesses come in or when next generations come in. I can tell you, we need to, to address these issues. We can't be put off years and years. It's really hard on businesses, and everyone knows what businesses are going through now. My God, let's not make it harder on people. It's like it's, it's, hard, to pay, it's hard to pay our bills. We're working our tails off, and I guarantee – Every other business is having their challenges too, and I highly encourage you guys to open the thought process and advance this area into something new and unique. And what's, you know, we've we've seen areas in San Diego do really exciting things. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen what's gone going up in Paso Robles. I've seen what's going on in certain parts of, you know, other neat coastal communities. And it's like Newport Beach is a innovative, like beautiful place to live and work. And what's let's let's move forward like let's not be stuck in an industrial use our entire time and let's have this be vibrant something that the that the community's excited about and can participate in and and um great yep. you know there's another business i believe they're in, in Co costa mesa but called trenta 
and it's a restaurant you, over there that's really me? neat. And okay. Yeah, we're, so you just reached your three minutes. If you could just finish up real quick, please. Okay. But anyhow, I'm here to support them, and uh, please consider this. I think it would be something the community would be really, uh, would really appreciate. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the next speaker, please. All right, looks like we don't have any. Do we have any calls? All right, we'll take the calls. Hi, go ahead. Hi, so you want to you want to mute what you're listening to and then go ahead and start speaking. Yes. Tell me when I when you're ready. Uh, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Baki. I am a property owner in Newport Beach in the zone. I actually live within a half mile from here. Um, I have studied this ever since I saw it on the agenda. My property value, my property value is that what is at stake and i think that a walkable route from my home to a wine tasting room would be a good thing for my neighborhood i fully support this i actually go jogging through this area five days a week i know this area very well i have coffee in this very area at daydream coffee quite often i even get my car detailed here i used to i have used one of the powder coating businesses right in the same parking lot but in the past this was a bad area uh, this used to be a place where homeless people gathered and camped. It was horrible. It was an eyesore in Newport Beach. But there was a big fire due to some bad management, some homeless camp. They cleared it out, and it's changed. Since then, there have been many great small businesses there, and this would be a great addition. This is not another thing that would create more dive bars or a sudden flood of beer halls. There are no bars in Newport that are close to this, so it would not be a concentration of alcohol drink. In fact, the closest bar is on Placentia in uh, Costa Mesa. Guys, this will not turn the area into an Oktoberfest. In fact, I think actually the opposite will happen. It will draw professionals and educated people who want to taste quality wine. In my opinion, Newport needs something like this, and this would be a classy thing for Newport Beach. People in Newport often go to Temecula for wine tasting, and that is business that Newport is losing. Changing the zoning in this situation would benefit the city and keep that business and that money in Newport Beach. If wine tasting rooms are allowed, I do not think this would create an inundation of wine drinking. Most of the businesses in this area are for auto mechanics. Uh, there's an interior design. There's coffee shops. And they're great businesses with great people. I am not concerned that this will affect my property value, and I support it wholeheartedly. You may not live in this area, guys, but I do, and I want to see this available. I think this would be a good thing for Newport Beach, a good thing for the area of Newport Crest and all of the homes on Monrovia Avenue, and I fully support it, and I ask you to support it, too. Thank you. Thank you. Any other calls? All right. Hi, go ahead. Hi, this is Dorothy Krauss, and I'm calling from Newport Crest, and I can tell you that this idea to put a single-use winery tasting in a very nice, small, industrial zone district is not a good idea. It is, it is a nice district. It looks good. I, I live here. Uh, it's got some uh, design studios. It has some... Um, other kinds of uh, businesses that deserve the respect to continue to operate like this. Um, where, where did this idea ever come, to, come from? How did it ever make it to the, the planning commission? There was never any outreach to the communities surrounding this area, not even a courtesy outreach. Um, it doesn't need to be revitalized. We're, we're recognizing a business, and thank you, Diane Dixon, for your careful review and those questions you asked, because this is a business that is, is confronted with enforcement actions. Why are we rewarding this business? This is spot zoning. To me, it's, I don't get it, and I don't even think it needs to be studied any further. I would really appreciate it being folded in to the housing element, uh, housing element element update process because that's where it belongs. That's, West Newport is one of the areas that the committee is looking at uh, with site opportunities. This is the cart before the horse. Thank you very much. Please vote no. Thank you. 
Any other calls? Okay, we'll bring it back uh, and start with Ms. Brenner. I had a question about uh, something that Phil Greer said about that the city granted them a conditional use permit 10 years ago. There, th thank you, uh, Councilmember Brenner. There was a, um, an interim study done and a use was granted for the manufacturing of wine. That's how they started. It was a manufacturing place, right? Industrial zone, they manufactured. So they manufactured wine. Um, they had a little tasting room. But that, that use was allowed because it was manufacturing and that got codified. So over, the, over time, their use morphed from manufacturing. They stopped manufacturing and it became just wine tasting and they start serving the food and that's where we are today. And one further question. Um, so it's my understanding that we've sort of postponed the general plan update process while we're doing the housing element update and the circulation plan update, those two elements of the general plan. So would this area other than for housing be considered during the housing element update discussions or, or will this wait until we discuss the entire general plan? So this area will, is being considered for housing opportunity. It's not being considered for a future um, restaurant use or alcohol use. So if, if, it looks, if we're looking for commercial uses, then we'll have to wait through the general plan update process. But if we're using, looking for housing, unit, housing opportunity sites, then it'll be currently in the housing element update committee. Okay, thank you. Mr. Duffield. Thank you. Um, I don't know really what my point, point is here, but I can bring some history to this. So I, I started my, my deal 50 years ago, about a quarter mile away. So I've watched that community grow and change and morph into other things. What, what the issue is, the, the uh, down and dirty industrial manufacturing just does not exist there. Um, I had to move, we all had to move. That used to be the number one build, boat building area in the United States. Um, there's not one single boat builder there now. So things have changed. And um, what has happened is you have now what I call um, a pseudo re retail. So since people aren't manufacturing, you know, make, taking raw materials and turning them into a product, they're more, more, more like assembly or they sell things, you can go buy, you can go up and down those streets, which is in total violation. Um, you can buy things it, 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 as a retail outlet. And they hide under the guise that they're um, wholesale. So when they're wholesale in a manufacturing area, um, then it, it, they kind of look, we all look the other way. So it's, an, it's, um, it's going to change. And, and maybe it's the general plan that has to do it. I, I get that, all that. Um, but I just give this group an understanding that it is not heavy industrial manufacturing because of the proximity it is to the ocean. Any, anything that's within bicycle riding to the surf beach, those properties have gone through the roof and you cannot um, have, it, it's difficult to hire employees and be competitive in the world when the all the rents and everything, it's all changed, okay? Now how you guys wanna change it in officially, that's a, a procedure that, um, that you have to look forward to. But today, right now, this um, outfit that was, and, and, and to my point, I understand they started out manufacturing, which was okay, and then there was a little tasting, and then it morphed into um, uh, representing um, another company that makes it and they just sell it. So then to me, you know, that's basically what the whole neighborhood is doing now. So you could make a case for every, almost every business there that sells full retail, that that's not fair. <laughs> it's not zoned for that. But anyway, I, I give you that history, you do with it what you want. Um, I feel like this um, is such an inconsequent, it's such a small wine tasting thing and I don't think it would, um, in the big picture, hurt anything at all up there. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avery. Yeah, so this is, well, it, this is not about, you know, a small business, but it is about a small business. And, and uh, these guys have been, you know, entrepreneurs in a way. Um, they haven't been following the rules all the time, but they've, I think they've been running a good operation. Um, this could be a great area of, of this kind of thing. It really has, I think, potential, um, you know, creating a, a discrete zone, if you will, for this, somewhat similar to what the diagram showed. Um, and then maybe there's, there's residential around it and it's got a mix of architecture firms and, you know, uh, just unique shops and all that, just a whole nother area in the town. So there's, there's a lot of potential here, and um, and I think it should be explored. And and um, so I don't know if there's a way to parse it where you can, you know, keep these guys where they are for the time being until we figure out what this should be, and and if there's a way to do it without waiting for the full general plan thing, maybe we should look at that. At the same time. Um, you know, we need to respect our process that we have. So I don't know, we, we should put our heads together and figure out a way to uh, move forward and accomplish some things and, and not throw out, you know, our processes for planning, be able to maybe track it in a different way um, and at least <laughs> look at this, this zone that we've created just now, um, on paper at least, and, and try to figure something out. And... Um, maybe create something really pretty interesting. And, and, but it's going to take time. It's going to take people coming together and discussing it. Cause there's a lot of different views. But I think in general, uh, I think a lot of people are supportive of this sort of business, these kinds of businesses that Duffy described um, being all together, a lot of energy, um, a lot of great places for people to go and, and be together, dynamic, uh, small shops, uh, not that small entrepreneurs just working away and doing things, artists, the whole thing, you know, it's great. So um, I, I'm, it's hard because we want to follow the general plan and we should be using the general plan, but there's, then there's some, some exceptions. You know, I first thought of this as spot zoning, which it really was and is, but maybe we, we back away from that and we look at this and we, 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 take a look. I think things can come in from a different direction. This is something from a different direction. And um, maybe we, I, I'm open to looking at something that at least take a look, maybe a quick strike look for three months or something and figure it out and see if we can work it out without losing a business. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to think for a second because I haven't spoken yet. And I know I'm going to begin to uh, Ms. Dixon and Mr. Muldoon who have both spoken. Just trying to decide if I want to speak right now. Um, maybe let me ask, do you do you mind? Okay. okay. So there maybe there are a couple questions to ask. First off, um, what was originally presented to the planning commission was not is not what came to us right now. So what was originally presented to us is a much smaller. Um, it affects the same zone, but it would affect a far smaller number of, of buildings. Therefore, you know, yeah, re getting rid of a lot of the the concerns that a lot of people would have in surrounding communities um, or surrounding areas, and and essentially preserving what is operationally what has been in in the area for years now. So um, let me come back to a term that was just used. This is going to go to Mr. Harp. So. Uh, one of the one of the discussions that comes up from time to time is the concept of spot zoning, and um, maybe just for for clarification with members of the public, what that is, and um, whether what was originally proposed to the planning commission, which just I, let me back up for a second, I should probably actually clarify what was originally proposed to the planning commission, um, what was originally proposed by the to the planning commission that the planning commission struck out was. Um, whether there would be uh, not only 500 feet of separation from any schools, but 500 feet uh, for, of separation from any particular um, business that's operating uh, a tasting room. And 
So that would obviously limit the number in this area significantly. Uh, but, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out when that was presented to the planning commission, was that spot zoning? So in, in general, spot zoning is when you either give a specific benefit or a, a, a impose a restriction on a very small parcel of land. So when, when it was initially presented to the Planning Commission, it was much closer to what spot zoning is. Um, when you're giving a benefit to a small parcel of land, you can still spot zone, but you have to show that there's a public benefit in, in order to uh, move forward with that. Um, but what's presented to now tonight and the changes the Planning Commission made definitely open it up so you're not dealing with one small parcel of land so spot zoning wouldn't be applicable to what's uh, before you this evening well what about though let's what if what if the what if the preference at the dais right now was to ease into this in in a way where you are looking at what was originally presented to the planning commission in a way that um you know approaches this in a so that so that we have we it's not quite maintaining status quo but it's fairly close in terms of the operational area so that as we move forward with this we have a, a decent sense of it is that spot zoning so if you're dealing with what was originally presented to the planning commission um, I'd feel a lot better about a decision that you made if you found that there was some public benefit involved with doing that spot zoning and in the context of so the answer you're you're saying is it's awfully close and and so if we were going to do that we'd have to be discussing the public benefit uh, yeah. that, that is not currently in the, at least not currently in the staff report discussed that way. That's right. Yeah, we can talk about it now. Simone, why don't you come up for a second? So um, in the context of discussions on something like this, when you went to the planning commission, uh, or at least when this was originally presented and recommended to the planning commission, was there a discussion about a public benefit um, to the uh, particular parcel uh, discussed? No, from a staff standpoint, we didn't look at it as a spot zone. And um, if Mr. Mayor, if you mind, I have a slide that would show how many other parcels would be affected. Okay. If we incorporate that 500 foot um, around um, each use, if you'd like to see that. I, I would, yeah. Could you go ahead and put the PowerPoint? So there, there was no public benefit that was um, looked at. Let me see if here if I can... So assuming the OC winery is the applicant um, and they would process a CUP, and if we implement what the original plan was, was that 500 foot separation, those two parcels on the far right would be allowed to, uh, one of them would be allowed to obtain uh, or submit an application for a CUP for the similar use. Because of that, we didn't think this was, we, from a staff standpoint, we didn't think that this was spot zoning. Mr. Harp, your city attorney said, you know, it's, it's right on the border there. So hence, because there was another allowed, another property that could benefit from this proposal, we didn't look for a, a finding for public benefit. Okay. Well, um, my, my general sense on this one is that, uh, <laughs> I, I, and this is a hard one. I don't usually say that. I think this is a hard one. I think, um, I think where we, I think where we probably need to get to um, is uh, I think we ought to send it back to Planning Commission. Um, I think we ought to have them take another look at this uh, exact this issue right here of the 500 500. So 500 from a school, 500 from um, the uh, um, 500 from the school, 500 from the um, another use. Uh, I think they ought to analyze it from the perspective of uh, spot zone and uh, they ought to analyze it from the public benefit side of things and make a recommendation on that front um, and I think they ought to do it soon uh, I don't I'm not asking for this to this, this does not need to be a full-blown um, huge update um, you know they don't need to do an economic analysis or anything along those lines I would recommend at least you know just providing a little bit of notice um, into some of the communities, at least reach out to some of the HOAs in the area. I know they've got, you know, we've got um, HOAs in the area. It's probably worth just reaching out to some of them um, and making sure that they are aware of this discussion 
At, and then I also think we ought to reach out to Cardin Hall and Pacifica and just make sure that they don't have any concerns. I doubt it, but it's probably worth just making sure that they don't. Um, but I do think this is worthy of, an, of, a, of, of, a, of a more robust discussion. Um, I, I recognize the concerns when it comes to changing the character of the community, um, changing the character of, a, of an area that I'm hearing tonight from my colleagues. Um, and at the same time, recognizing that operationally, that's, we, if, we, if we did this, if we approved this, we really wouldn't be changing the character of that, that area at all, which has been operating like this for years now. And um, you haven't heard any objections, at least I haven't, from any of the business owners in the community, or nor residents. Um, I recognize that they're not currently, or at least it sounds like, I'm, I won't pass judgment, it sounds like they're not currently in compliance with, with our zoning code. And maybe that's, maybe that's one of those times where we, we just take into account the, you know, the years of operation without, without you know, outside complaints. So in this, in this case, I'd rather, I'd feel more comfortable having the Planning Commission study this exact issue and make a recommendation on public benefit. If they can't come up with a public benefit, then that's where we are. Uh, but if, that's, if we find ourselves in a position of being able to work within what we've already seen working in the area um, and then have a more robust discussion on what this area ought to look like in the future, then that, that seems like we're kind of at least finding a middle ground that, that um, it, it takes more time, but at least we're finding a middle ground, I think, that, that where we can get to. Anyway, all right, um, Ms. Dixon. Okay, um, thank you, Mayor. That's one approach. My, um, I have a different point of view. Um, I, d I think the Planning Commission will have, they, any Planning Commission has difficulty establishing policy. They're, they're just interpreting the rules of the game, and so they're being asked to make new rules. Uh, and just as Dorothy Krauss or Jim Mosier said, uh, we haven't, I mean, the, the council member representing this district has never even had a community meeting on this subject, and here we have heard from 30 people who think we need a zoning change. I, I just think that that's where the cart's before the horse, or where the tail's wagging the dog, use whatever metaphor you want. This is just so uh, uh, contrary to how Newport Beach functions whether it's a controversial uh, subject or not. I, in my mind's eye, I could see this area exactly what we're envisioning. I think all of us could think this could really be a great Soho-type part of our city, and that would be fabulous. But let's do it right. Let's go through a process, involve the business owners, not just 30. They're more. I've got a map in my folder here. There are probably 200 business owners in this part of the city. So we've heard from 30 of them, and great, they're invested in the community. I want it to be a thriving part. We all want it to be a successful, thriving part. I mean, it, our general plan identified it as marine services because the general plan moved it all off the peninsula up to the industrial zone, and now there are no marine services up there. So there is so much potential to really make this area special and to get ahead of ourselves for one establishment uh, is, in my opinion, the wrong way to go. I do not think it should go to the Planning Commission. I think it should be community-driven, and the final plan or a plan ultimately needs to be heard by the Planning Commission. But I, I don't think the Planning Commission, they can maybe adjudicate on this one area and the public benefit, but it's a broader engagement. If we were not in the middle of, or hopefully we're at the end of this pandemic crisis, the way we are living, uh, but because of the housing crisis and the demands placed on planning and community development, um, the resource issue is significant. Otherwise, I would say let's pull this out of the general plan process, and I don't know which element this is, industrial uses, I guess, and, and have, a, have a committee, an ad hoc committee formed on industrial uses and really look at this and have all the neighboring residents and the businesses participate and engage in a, in a visioning process. That could be exciting, and the end result can truly be wonderful for this city. But to, I'll use the term loosely, spot zone for one establishment that's driving this whole discussion when there is the possibility of an, a richer, uh, more, benef more community beneficial uh, outcome to this instead of just singling, focusing on this one business. 
Um, I kind of like maybe what uh, Council Member Avery was suggesting. There may be, I always like to find where can we find a solution, even in the short term, even though they're non conforming. So, Mr. Georges, if you wouldn't mind coming back up, do you see any way possible during this period, interim period, we're trying to figure this out in the broader sense? Uh, could they be continuing to operate legally in a non conforming use until? for maybe one or two years uh, to, now they're not operating now because of the violation of the city use, it's because their business was closed. Right. But when businesses resume, I guess they were considered a bar if in that case, but is there any way that we could allow them to, once they return to operating status, could they operate legally within the city while we figure this out? You know, we, we don't have any tools to allow a non-confirming use or an illegal use to continue for one or two years. You know, the, the, we only, the only tools we have are maybe like a 90-day limited-term permit at, at best. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is an act of enforcement that we suspended for, one, you know, for them to find a new location, and two, to see where this goes. You know, I just don't have any tools to continue to allow an illegal operation like this. And so one establishment is driving the need to rezone this area without any community input, not even the support of the local council member, and we're just imposing this because somebody, 30 people think it would be a great idea. That's not, is that planning in your book? Well, we, we came to the city council and asked the council if they wanted to initiate a, a zone change for this. So we came to the council to ask, and so we got the direction to go ahead and initiate, and that's, that's where we are. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Muldoon. Thank you, I, I don't know what's exciting about putting someone out of business. The general plan is not a sacred document. It's meant to be amended, that's what amendments are for. Those who live lives of luxury and want to squash other people's dreams or businesses will often use rules like those made up by the general plan and say, uh, you can't have that liberty, you can't have that property right, it says here in this document, and they'll omit the most important part, that document was not meant to confine. It was meant to plan, it was meant to be amended. Um, you know, what is sacred is feeding your family. What is sacred is having employees being able to pay their salary. What is sacred is having the right to gather somewhere. Uh, from a business standpoint, the landlord, this, this tenant is not the landlord. The landlord's gonna do what the landlord's gonna do with the property. Some people want to make it housing. I'd rather not be housing. I'd rather keep a, uh, an industrial, uh, soon-to-be retail feel. Uh, if, if you want it to be housing and we zone it housing down the road and that's the highest and best use for the property, I bet it's going to be housing. Um, but I, I think the calls to buy more time and you know, to have things over planned are so disingenuous. I, I can't believe it. It wouldn't be approved on the peninsula. People would fight on the peninsula. Th this is about putting a business out of business because someone doesn't like the way it got there. It's an operating business. Uh, it morphed into what other neighbors are generally accepting as, as their reality, which is retail, because as Mr. Duffield explained, uh, times are changing. And, uh, you know, I think it's really unfair to hide behind bureaucracy and, and general plans. General plans are not meant uh, to be more important than people. And I'd like to make a motion to, uh, to approve the item. I understand the mayor's point as well, and I'm open to that, but I'm wondering if we have four votes to approve the item tonight. All right, we have a motion. I'll second that. Seconded by Mr. Duffield. All right, Ms., uh, we'll have a debate on the motion. Ms. Brenner. Um, I had a question for Simone. Um, they mentioned coffee houses and restaurants and some retail and that sort of thing in this area. Are those also out of compliance? So my understanding is those there's some that are mostly in Costa Mesa. Oh, they're over the border. Correct. So we don't really Be, have. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna reach out to my staff. Okay. David, do you know if anything else within this area, or abuses? There's a coffee roaster um, in that area that does some on-site tasting. So a coffee roaster with some tasting, and there's a, a catering facility uh, in, in our zone. Everything else is in Costa Mesa. And, and as far as retail goes, are there businesses there that are conducting retail operations? You know, there may be. We haven't done a full enforcement sweep. That's, that's what I'm concerned about, is that 
this area is changing so much that we may be penalizing this one business when the whole area may be transitioning to something like, I, I just really wish we could find a, a way to study this and do some outreach and not wait two years for a general plan. I'm, I'm going to rely on, on Brad and your recommendation on what you think we should do on this. I'm going to vote with, with you however you think we should proceed. Okay. All right. Uh, well, we have, would you like to explain how you're going to vote, Brad? Because <laughs> apparently you carry two. <laughs> yeah, I, as it is, I don't think works. We, we need to have some sort of ability to study this, get the, bring the community together uh, out of the, and, and, and then work out some sort of extension for this business while we do this. You know, I don't know what's legally possible, but, what, or, but that's what that's the only thing we can do here is kind of bring people together and really get a sense of it because there's a lot of people that own the dirt around there and, and they, we haven't heard from them how they feel. And then we have the businesses, we have schools, there's a lot here. But I think we could do it, you know, just by doing some community forums and get and come back and and at least get a better sense of what we're looking at here. May I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Is there a council action that we could take to uh, give a, a 120 or six month or one year permit extension while we go through this process? Have a permit. You know, I don't have anything besides um, a limited term permit that um, can go forward with 90 days and maybe another 90 day extension. Um, another avenue maybe, and, and I know this is slippery slope, but maybe if the council approved tonight's item with some direction to staff to study that area and then come back with something broader. You know, the, the, I think those are the two, two options that come to mind. Um, again, we have a limited term permit, but it's very, very limited. You know, it's only for the, the 90 day per, um, only 90 day period. Again, if the council wants to go ahead and, and if they would be so inclined to approve tonight's item and then direct staff to study that area kind of in a broader kind of a broader review and then return at a at some point in the future. Um, maybe, maybe that's another option for the council. Well, can I ask Simone what Simone, what's a conditional permit? So a conditional use permit is a discretionary action at the planning commission or the zoning administrator. So, we, we, but we don't have that, we don't allow that right now. And tonight's agenda item would impose a CUP and impose a conditional use permit if the council approved the item tonight. So it's discretionary. So, hang on, sorry, hang on one second. So let's talk about that limited term permit for just a second. Um, we're in late August. I mean, we're talking 90 day, what, what is that limited use permit? Let's say it's 90 days. So if you could issue a 90 day permit to allow the current operations so that they're at least in compliance for 90 days, in those 90 days, you have three planning commission meetings, basically, or more, but potentially three planning commission meetings. You could have a planning commission meeting. You could have community outreach. You could also have a planning com commission meeting um, in November. Um, where you have a situation where you can make this, you, you can bring it back. So, I mean, I, I think we do, I think they really should go back and reanalyze the 500-500 the um, and make a determination on public benefit um, because you'd have a much smaller impact on surrounding community. You'd have a very a much smaller impact in the area. Um, you'd maintain very similar to what status quo is, and we'd also have the 90-day permit to make sure that if there are any concerns in those 90 days by anyone, they can raise them pretty quickly on an operational basis. So if you had a situation like that where you, they, they at least are conforming for a limited duration, you have some discussion out in public, um, because you're right, this is, the, this is the second time it's come to council. It would be the second time it'd be at planning commission. There's plenty of opportunity for public comment, pl plenty of opportunity for public dialogue in those in the in the next 90 days um, then what you're what you're doing is you are at least reaching out and making sure people have a sense of what it is and also um, you know allowing again that the business to at least operate for that time that time period and if you if you get to that point 
and we have this discussion and the public and the um and the planning commission comes to a conclusion yes or no uh there's a public benefit or there's not a public benefit we at least need them to, to articulate it i mean that's one of the things i, I agree to, with councilmember dixon's point the planning commission is not tasked with with policy making but they are tasked with at least interpreting the code and making making recommendations on a public benefit they do that all the time that's one of the things we we get recommended to us constantly from the planning commission so they're 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 well tasked with that they just didn't do it on this one because what they did was they just removed it out because they didn't want to even have the discussion about spot zoning and they just opened it up and i get that i don't think it was right um with respect to our planning commissioners i just don't think that was a great idea given given the context of opening this up to a much broader issue without having those discussions out in the community um but but it, but we can send it back that's that's our job like that's our that's our policy making <laughs> ability so if there's the if there is the option to put them in a conforming state for 90 days while we do the some of the public outreach and have our planning commissioners take a look at that 500 500 uh, option with a with a the direction of giving us a public benefit i'd like to see that happen frankly is that possible based yes. on that yeah i think so and i think we could also i got to go back and look at the code i think the planning commission could actually extend that 90 days for an additional 90 days okay. so that, get, that gives me some breathing room to kind of do what the mayor has suggested all right well i used to be a uh, holistic review process it's it's not a it's not because so the question just to be clear was was if is that a high-speed holistic review process and i think the answer is no and the reason i say the answer i think the answer is no is because yes we are looking at modifying a zone a zoning change in a in a zone in, in the same way but if we're asking them not to take the perspective of just the 500 feet from a school and allowing 23 buildings and essentially most of the area to be rezoned and instead we're looking at a 500 500 rule where we know that the applicant in this area, in this in this approach would have that center basically taken up and you'd have two very small buildings you are not holistically changing that area um, which in my and, and you're really going to a status quo operationally what it's been for years so if we're doing it in an approach like that then what we're really saying is um, we're trying to keep a status quo in the area um, and we're also at the same time you know acknowledging that yeah this is pretty it is pretty close to spot zoning um, and so if we're if we're getting pretty close to spot zoning i do want it to get back to a planning commission to have a review of a public benefit and if they can if they can find it great if they can't find it not great um, for the owner but at least they're, they've gone through the process that we expect them to be going through and we've we would have gone through the exact same process miss brenner your ex officio on the housing element update committee do you know whether they are studying this area as one of the potential areas for housing? I think they'd have to. And, and can we include that in our proposed, having the Planning Commission look at this, but also getting some feedback from the Housing Element Update Committee about this area before we go spot zoning? Yeah, so, so the answer is we don't, we don't need to. And, I, and, I, and I, let me explain why. So um, the, if we get to a point where we are looking at um, an updated housing committee um, uh, housing so we're not, if we're not changing the general plan uh, based on a, a modification of the zoning in this case then we're not actually change we, we, we're not doing any kind of designations that would have long-lasting effects beyond the zone change and zoning goes along with your general plan so you know zoning is driven by your general plan so if your general plan says we need we're, we're going to phase in housing in this area Mm -hmm. then your zoning needs to uh, uh, go your, your zoning needs to get changed to comply with your general plan amendment are we anticipating that will happen in i don't in know housing i don't know but but it, but there's no but you you also have the ability and i'll just say real quickly so let's say for example that this became an area where we wanted to put more housing high density housing even you have the ability and i'm not saying we do but i'm just saying if we if we're looking and we come to the conclusion that this is an area we'd like to phase in on on a on that what we can do is the exact same thing we've done every time as a city we change our general plan which is you can modify the general plan to um to phase in over a number of years 
uh, that area. So this is an area actually, Simone, why don't you come on up for a second? So this is a really good example actually. So down in near where kind of Pacifica Christian is, for example, um, Pacifica Christian is an area that um, was, is general planned to an area that actually can switch over to housing at some point, right? So what we've done is we can phase in through our zone, zoning code, the same thing the general plan contemplates, because you, you wouldn't switch this automatically over to general, like this area wouldn't be switched over as a general plan update to suddenly be housing and put all of these in non-conforming and tell them, you know, you have 90 days to turn this into housing. You'd never do that, and we wouldn't do that. But the point is that as we phase this in, um, we have the ability to modify. So if we modify the zoning to uh, allow an additional use right now, it doesn't mean for a second that we can't modify it down the road in the general plan to be housing. And that's my point. And, and so what I'm saying, and I guess where I'm going with this, it's very long, but I needed to kind of explain the thought process. Where you're going with this is, even if, assuming we wanted to change this to housing, even if that's the recommendation that came from the housing element update and it got to us and we said, yes, that's where we need to put more housing, um, a, a change now to allow for what's happening there does not and will not affect that decision. Well, Am I, did I say in, it could be grand, well, well, but it, but but the that, but the industrial but it, it, it let's come back for a second. If we change if we don't change this and they and there's a um, and they leave and another business comes in, they're grandfathered in too. So it, it, the changing changing this doesn't change the, our ability to modify the the general plan down the road. Is what I'm saying. Is there anything I said, Simone, that was either incorrect or needs to be better explained? No, no. The, the general plan will set the, the path forward, and if you update the zoning code as you move forward to implement. The zoning code implements your general plan. And so, as you stated, Mary, I think you're, you're accurate, correct? Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Muldoon, then Ms. Dixon. Thank you. Um, if we were to head towards this path, Mr. Harp, and sort of have it become um, a little bit more... Uh, resembling spot zoning. Are we able to establish uh, public benefit this evening? Well, I definitely think there's there could be some public benefits that you could consider. And, you know, one is there's not any of these really type of facilities that are up there that are serving the public, and that could be a public benefit. I mean, there could be others, but there is a, uh, it seems to be a lack of these type of visitor, or not visitor, but um, general service type of businesses in the area, and that could be one basis for it. Well, whether we send it down to planning commission or we decide here this evening, uh, the buck only stops with us. I think we can establish a public benefit this evening from the dais and we take out any concerns that the planning commission is making a policy decision. I believe those, pu those public benefits include uh, what the gentleman said is a place he could walk to from his current residence to enjoy uh, interacting with others and a place that uh, he can patron. I believe it includes uh, pre preserving the, the value and um, preparing for what I think is going to be likely the future of this um, of this area, which will bring higher revenue in property taxes and in sales tax revenue, uh, especially if we're looking at a deficit in manufacturing and other retail sales that perhaps are struggling in this area. So I just wanted to set for the record some of the public benefit advantages to this decision uh, so that that's established here at our level. Um, I still would like to call the question, Mr. Mayor, as to whether or not there are four votes approved this evening. But at the same time, I'm very open to a compromise, um, which, you, which you suggested. So, Okay. So um, before we get to Ms. Dixon, there's been a call to question, which would shut off debate, uh, which requires a majority vote. Um, so I haven't done this in a while. Um, is there, is, do I need a second on a, a call to question, Mr. Herb? You know, Mr. Mayor, straw votes okay too. I don't want to, you know, stumble anyone. I'm just trying to get. A uh, I'll tell you what. Why don't we do? Why don't we have uh, one more public comment? Uh, then, if you wouldn't, so if you withdraw the the call to question, your motion is still the motion on the yes. floor. Okay. All right. Okay, Ms. Dixon. And then I just uh, have a quick question. Is, is there any way we could keep them in, in business without a zoning change? Not for the long term, for the short term, I think we have a path for that short term period up to maybe up to six months. And but, beyond that, I, I don't have right, any Okay, uh, that's fair because six months is better than 90 days. Uh, just so we don't, I mean, we can, we, we, I don't think we can create findings from the dais on whether there's a public benefit. We need to go through the process and have that be determined 
uh, by staff and, and the Planning Commission. Um, but I would be supportive. We're talking one business, keep them in business, I'm all for it. I wish, you know, there's so many open retail spaces on the peninsula, I would love them to have explored Balboa Village. That would be a tremendous asset to Balboa Village. But anyway, um, because there are other spaces where we wouldn't have to make any, we wouldn't have to have this discussion. It would be a matter because it's zoned for that. So the zoning is what's problematic, and it is what's, what's kind of creating this hurdle. So um, I would whose ever motion it is to incorporate, let them operate for six months, let's don't do a zoning change yet, and let's get the community involved, and eventually take it to the Planning Commission to determine and validate the public benefit, and then bring it back. Okay. All right, I'll tell you what. Let me, um, let me see if I can just kind of recap where I think we can get to, because Aaron, this is gonna, this, this, <laughs> this will be one of the more complicated Votes we've had in a while. All right, let's let's uh, come back for a second. So, if there's a uh, if there's a special permit that we can allow for 90 days, then it's potential for the planning commission to be able to extend it out um, potentially. I don't know, up to six months maybe. We can't actually direct the issuance of that special permit. Oh, we can. No. Oh, we can't. Okay. So what we're basically saying. Let me just back up for a second. So if if the compromise, if we had a compromise, if there's not four votes for Mr. Muldoon's motion. And the compromise motion that I would make afterward would be something to the effect of um, we would uh, send this back to the Planning Commission for a review of the 500-500, which was their original uh, motion, um, to be heard within 90 days unless they're unable to do so because they need more community input, at which point we are not directing, but we are strongly suggesting to Mr. Jurgis that he um, issue a special permit to put this business into compliance and then request an extension if the Planning Commission doesn't believe it can meet within 90 days on this issue. Is all of that legal? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, that is now Mr. Muldoon's uh, motion. Um, the second, who made the second? Mr. Duffield, do you accept that as a second? Okay. What is the motion? So the motion on the table is now um, sending it back to the Planning Commission for review within 90 days. If the Planning Commission believes that it cannot review within 90 days, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. We're sending it back to the Planning Commission to review uh, the original proposal that I'm calling the 500-500 proposal um, for a review of uh, a uh, uh, public benefit uh, determination and recommendation to the council. Um, the the expectation is that they would do so within 90 days, that um, the uh, recommendation from us, but not a direction, uh, would be to grant a special permit to allow for um, them to conform to their current use, uh, that if the Planning Commission is unable to meet or make that recommendation within 90 days due to um, a need for further public input, that uh, the planning committee or the um, uh, community development department bring back um, or recommend or request that the planning commission extend per code the um, the special permit and um, at no point uh, we don't have an uh, an outside date I would suggest six months Mr. Muldoon would you be open to that okay and with an outside extension no more than six months um, Mr. Duffield okay. All right, that is the motion on the table then. Any concern? Anything about community engagement? Yeah, I said yes, community engagement. That, that's why if, they, if the Planning Commission felt they needed more community engagement than 90 days would allow, that, they, that Mr. Church would bring. So are they driving the community engagement or is the ex Well, the expectation is that the Planning Commission would be taking in community engagement, but I would also expect our community development department to reach out to the communities in the area, including um, the schools, such as Cardin Hall and Pacifica. That's what I, would like. I mean, the Planning Commission doesn't do community engagement very well. It's the staff that drives. Okay, well, I would, I would, okay, then the recommendation would also be that um, staff bring the, uh, you know, participation. And if council members, including, of course, Mr. Avery would enjoy going, we would. Love it. There you go. Anyway, that's not part of the motion, but, um, but that's the, uh, but that's the answer to your clarification. All right, any um, discussion on that? Do we need to see this again? at the council? Yes, it'll come back to us. So the expectation would be that it would be a recommendation from the Planning Commission to us. It will come back to us. All right. 
Let's go, let's go ahead and vote. The amended motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, as we head into item number 17, there are a few of us that need to declare conflicts, and I will start. I have to declare a conflict because AT&T has worked with Ericsson on um, their telecommunication uh, polls. I previously disclosed this conflict because I represent Ericsson. Um, I am an attorney. They're one of my clients. And uh, so I will be declaring a conflict on this item as well. I, I, did, I need to also because of financial interest. And I have a conflict because of my prior employment in, tele, in telecommun, uh, telecommunications. Thank you. Four of us. We're going to need four. So for the, the appeal this evening, we will hear a staff report summarizing the issues for consideration by City Council. And then we'll, we will hear from the applicant who will be given 15 minutes for uh, its presentation. And then we will hear from the appellant who will be given 15 minutes for his pre presentation. And then we will hear from the public. And finally, the applicant will be given five minutes to address any issues raised before the public hearing is closed and the matter is returned to City Council. Before we get into the substantive, issue, the substantive issues related to this appeal, it is my understanding that we are, that there are some procedural issues that we should be aware of for this hearing, Mr. Harp. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just given the limited number of council members available to consider this item, I think it's important for the city council and public to know that under the city charter, to pass any resolution, the charter requires four affirmative votes. Uh, four votes are not received in support of a motion, this technically results in no action being taken and a new motion can be made. Um, if after exhausting all the motions, there's not the required number of votes to approve any resolution, the original decision of the Planning Commission would be the operative decision. So um, to take action tonight, you have to have all four votes. That's, that's it in sum. Thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Sadeba. Could you please summarize the nature of the hearing and the issues result to be resolved by City Council? Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Avery, and Council members. Uh, ben Zadiba, Senior Planner with the Planning Division. I'll give you a brief project uh, overview of what's before you this evening. And as you said, there are other speakers, so I'm not going to go into it in extreme detail. I'm going to keep it higher level. So once the PowerPoint boots up here, I'll have a uh, better outline for you. But I would also note that I have the real property administrator for the city, Lauren Whitting Whitlinger, with me if you have any uh, specific questions about the license agreement for that particular streetlight pole. I can go ahead and kind of start before that comes up uh, since we're not seeing the presentation. But basically before you is the appeal of the, there it is, the uh, Planning Commission's approval of a minor use permit and a coastal development permit. Uh, to install or to allow the installation rather of a small cell wireless telecommunications facility on top of a existing replaced rather streetlight pole. This particular location, if I may go to the next slide here. Let's see, there you go, okay. <clears throat> so the location is on the corner of 30th Street and Balboa Boulevard. You can see it is shown by the red circle. That is City Streetlight 0796. It's uniquely situated uh, in front of a 20 foot wide parkway that the city owns and maintains. Now to step back and give you some background, I would just go ahead and throw into context that the city's review is largely limited by federal law. That is to say that federal law regulates the emissions component largely, which is the Federal Communications Commission. They look at the radio frequency emissions. So uh, for the most part, the city cannot make a decision based on perceived health concerns or impacts. In this case, you're looking mostly at aesthetics, land use, and environmental impacts. So as you know, council authorized a master license agreement with New Singular Wireless in February of last year. Uh, to have non-exclusive access to streetlight poles 
for this particular purpose. On April 16th, 2020, the city zoning administrator did approve this application to allow the installation. Subsequently, it was appealed by an attorney, Mark Pollock, who is representing an anonymous resident of Newport Beach, uh, citing concerns with the master license agreement, not with the location itself, mind you. Uh, July 9th, it did get heard as a de novo hearing before the Planning Commission, and it was also approved. Uh, subsequently, July 15th, it was appealed, and that's why it's here before you tonight. So the project at hand is to remove that particular street light that you saw in the image, replace it in the same exact location. Uh, one key component is that the city requires the carrier, or the applicant, to maintain the same luminaire height, which is the light source. So in essence, it shouldn't look much different uh, from a parity standpoint. When you're looking down the street, it should blend right into the streetscape. Uh, the overall height increase to the top of the antenna shroud is approximately four and a half feet. And I would just note that this is a 4G wireless installation at this time. It is not a 5G wireless installation. Uh, they'd have to do some upgrades to that equipment and change the design in order to make that a 5G facility. Also, the supporting equipment is completely vaulted below grade such that you would not see that on the sidewalk. It will not hinder any public access. Again, the idea is it's taking place of an existing street light in the same exact location that you see there. As I said, it does require a minor use permit for a public right-of-way installation. It also requires a coastal development permit because it is located within the coastal zone. So just to give you a better idea of what it's going to look like, uh, here's the existing, and I did my best to superimpose the images for you if you give it a moment here. So the block that you see, that's not going to be part of the street light. That is a showing a potential to house a temporary banner if the city allows a banner installation for the holidays or some sort of special event. Um, that's not part of the proposal. It is just intended to show that it does have that capability. Uh, the most notable feature is, again, on top of the replaced street light, you will see the 12-inch uh, in diameter antenna shroud that does house the equipment. Again, nothing in terms of wiring or anything antenna-related will be visible uh, outside of that shroud. So as part of staff's analysis and as part of the applicant's requirements, they did look at alternative sites in the area. You'll see a number of them there. I know that the applicant will speak later. Um, I don't know if they'll go into detail on this, but they certainly can if you so wish to hear that. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of these are on wooden utility poles, and this is an underground assessment district, so they didn't see it as something that was feasible or that made sense for this particular project. Um, also, the fact that this particular location is in front of a 20-foot wide parkway makes it unique for the area. Most of the utility poles are right up against a residential property, uh, so it was seen as the best and least intrusive location. So although not required, the applicant did provide coverage maps as well. Uh, you can see the black dot is the proposed facility location with the proposed facility online, you can see that there is a substantial increase in coverage for that area. Again, this is not something that was required of the applicant. They provided it to substantiate their request for this particular location. So in terms of findings, in order to recommend approval or approve a minor use permit, coastal development permit, uh, you have to find that it is consistent with the city's local coastal program, which in this case, staff does believe it is. Consistent with the zoning code and general plan, which again, staff uh, believes it is consistent with all of the provisions in the code as well as general plan land use policies. It is visually compatible. As I said, the luminaire height and the location in front of a landscape parkway make it such that it blends into the streetscape. And lastly, it complies with all Title 20 and Title 21 development standards that are pertinent to wireless telecommunication facilities. Uh, in this case, it is less than 35 feet tall. It is 34 feet 9 inches. Uh, 35 feet is the absolute maximum for these types of facilities. <clears throat> but the existing streetlight pole, I'll note, is approximately 30 feet tall. Uh, so they are working with a taller pole to begin with. Uh, all of the equipment is concealed within the pole and underground. And again, alternative sites were considered. So lastly, I'm not going to go into each appeal point. I'll let the appellant talk about that. And the uh, a representing attorney or legal counsel for AT&T can also talk about that. Uh, but there are three main points to the appeal. Uh, once again, not citing concerns with this particular location, rather calling into question uh, the integrity of the master license agreement and the applicant submitting the application. 
So with that, staff is recommending that you conduct a new public hearing, find the project exempt from CEQA, and adopt a resolution to approve the minor use permit and coastal development permit, which will uphold the Planning Commission's decision and deny the appeal. As I said, I'm available for questions. Lauren Wooding Whitlinger is here as well, and you can roll right into the appellants and applicant presentations if you please. Thank you. Do we have any questions from council uh, to Mr. Sadiba? No questions? All right, so now we'll hear from the applicant who will be given up to, up to 15 minutes for his presentation. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Avery and Council. My name is Corey Autry. I work with Wireless Policy Group here tonight representing AT&T. And just to 100% confirm, you would like to hear from AT&T first before you hear from the appellant. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. So I also have with me tonight Judy Woolen from AT&T's External Affairs um, team and Franklin Orozco from um, AT&T's network development vendor. And also on the Zoom call, we have Emily Murray from Alan Matkins, who is AT&T's outside counsel. And I will quickly turn it over to Emily, but first I want to just um, state that I was very involved in the negotiation of the master license agreement that the council approved in February of 2019. And I can assure you it was not a fly-by-night, you know, overnight sensation. It was an 18-month-long negotiation with city staff, um, very savvy um, negotiation uh, with your attorney involved, AT&T's attorney, and many of us business folks. So I just thought it'd be important to, um, you know, kind of share a little bit of that history. And with that, it looks like we have Emily on the line. So I will turn it over to AT&T's outside counsel, Emily Murray, to talk more in detail about the um, appeal items. Good evening, thank you. Can you hear me okay I, on the Zoom? I'm gonna thumbs up on that. Um, my name is Emily Murray. I'm with the law firm Alan Matkins. I'm outside legal counsel to AT&T. Uh, I want to just briefly address the legal issues raised in the appeal uh, and then Corey and team can certainly um, answer technical questions that folks have about the location, how it was selected, the facility, how it operates and the like. Uh, there were three primary points made by the appellant legal arguments made in the appeal. The first is that the party to the master license agreement is not the same as the applicant. The um, master license agreement was signed by New Singular Wireless PCS LLC. And on the application, uh, the party signing the application is AT&T Mobility. Um, on behalf of New Singular Wireless PCS, uh, AT&T has provided to staff um, the recorded fictitious business name um, statement filed with the county clerk for Orange County that indicates that those two entities are the same, that AT&T Mobility is a uh, fictitious business name for New Singular Wireless PCS. So that, that entire argument is, is just a red herring. They are the same entity, uh, the party to the, to the master license agreement and the party who submitted the application. Um, the second legal argument was that insufficient proof of insurance has been provided to the city. Uh, again, the city attorney and city staff have confirmed that they've received all necessary documentation to confirm that um, the applicant is properly insured, uh, particularly with regard to EMF. AT&T is a uh, self-insured for pollution coverage, which includes hazardous material and EMF. So again, there's no... Um, legal validity to the arguments around insurance. Uh, and the final argument is really a, functionally, I think, the same as the first argument. The um, city's code requires that an applicant enter into a master license agreement with the city. In this case, uh, AT&T, the new singular wireless, entered into the master license agreement. That is the same entity as the applicant, um, AT&T Mobility. So they're the, the applicant has entered into a master license agreement with the city and has satisfied those code requirements. So none of these um, arguments have any legal merit uh, or pose any risk to the city. The city attorney so advised the planning commission um, when the same arguments were presented to the planning commission and those arguments haven't evolved or uh, been restated or you know, the, the, the 
of the same failing legal arguments that were raised below. Um, so at and again, respectfully requests that the appeal be denied uh, by the City Council this evening, and we would be happy, um, Corey and the team, to answer any questions that you have about the facility itself. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Um, do we have any uh, council members who have questions of the applicant? So we, yeah, this is Corey again. I just wanted to let, let, uh, remind the council that we did give a small cell overview presentation when we got the MLA approved. And um, so we hadn't planned on going into a lot of overview detail, but we're happy to go into detail on the specific location that's before you this evening, although we do feel it was very well vetted by the zoning administrator and also the planning commission. So if you'd like us to go into more detail on how we chose that location, we're happy to do that, but I thought I'd ask before we just spent the time on that. Any questions? No questions. Thank you. All right. Um, no other comments from the applicant? We'll be That's coming it. back to you. Thank you. So now we'll hear from the appellant who will be given up to 15 minutes for their presentation. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Pollock. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Um, my name is Mark Pollock, and as has been explained by staff, I represent a citizen of Newport Beach um, who has preferred to remain anonymous for fear of retribution by filing this appeal. I have appealed the decision from the zoning administrator on this uh, deployment um, to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission sustained the decision of the Zoning Administrator, and I now bring the issue to you. This particular appeal is not in the nature of an opposition to the deployment and placement of the technology. Rather, it's to scrutinize the way the permit was issued because of our collective concern about the liability of the city in the event that the placement ends up injuring someone, causes fire, or some other problem um, potentially related to EMF exposure. So initially, if I may walk you through, I provided written materials to each member of the council, and there are exhibits attached. As um, Mr. Autry pointed out, the master license agreement is required for placement of the technology on city property. This pole is city property. There was a master license agreement crafted consistent with Title 20.49.080. And as Mr. Autry pointed out, um, it was signed by uh, the uh, entity um, which was um, identified on it um, as New Singular Wireless PCS LLC. It did not list a DVA. It did not list a fictitious business name on that master license agreement. You can see by looking at Exhibit A attached behind my brief it says new singular wireless PCS LLC, a Delaware limited liability company licensee. It does not list a DBA. The reason that this is important from the city's perspective is that consistent with this master license agreement, the licensee under the agreement indemnifies and holds the city harmless for liability. In addition, it must provide a general liability policy of insurance. And the city has requested that that particular policy of insurance not exclude EMF coverage under a pollution exclusion. So when the um, zoning administrator issued the permit, the permit was not issued to AT&T Mobility. It was simply issued to AT&T. 
that's not consistent with the master license agreement. Even if AT&T was a DBA, AT&T is not a corporation in California. AT&T is not an LLC in California. If you look at exhibit B, this is the Secretary of State's information filed by New Singular Wireless PCS LLC. If you go down to item 5B, you will see that the manager of that company is AT&T Mobility Corporation. That's not a DBA. That's a Delaware Corporation. AT&T Mobility Corporation is not registered to do business in California. AT&T Mobility Corporation cannot legally do business in the state of California. So if you look at Exhibit D, which is the fictitious business name statement provided by the company to staff on this matter, you'll see that the signature at the bottom right for the entity that submitted it and filed it was a corporation that cannot do business in the state of California, AT&T Mobility Corporation, comma, manager. This document is void. It has no legal authority. AT&T Mobility is not a legal DBA for new singular wireless PCS, LLC. All that I was asking this entity to do, the uh, planning commission and before them the zoning administrator was to correct the permit and put the permit in the name of the entity that signed the master license agreement, new singular wireless PCS LLC. By doing that, we would ensure that the indemnity provisions of that document are legal and enforceable. Right now, they're not. <coughs> Moving on to the issue of insurance, I did a Public Records Act request as part of pursuing this appeal, and I was astounded. If you'll turn to uh, the three emails which I've attached as F1, F2, and F3, on F1, uh, Fauna Schrago from the city requested a full copy of the entire uh, policy of insurance from New Singular Wireless PCS LLC. And that request was made on behalf of the risk manager for the city so they could evaluate the exclusions and limitations on coverage. If you turn to F2, you get the response from Dan Bosnilik, the senior technical manager for AT&T Mobility. He says, Fauna, I left you a voicemail last Friday. We reached out to our risk management group regarding this issue. Unfortunately, AT&T is unable to issue a renewal certificate of insurance prior to the renewal date. AT&T renews every year at the same time. The certificate does not entire expire until June 1st, 2020. So when the certificate expired, they obtained a new certificate and that certificate now is in the name of New Singular Wireless. Then the next paragraph is very telling. We did confirm that AT&T is self-insured for pollution coverage. We do not produce copies of AT&T's insurance policy because it is confidential and proprietary in nature. So the risk manager never got to see the policy. It was never produced. If you turn to the next email, this email at the top um, is authored by Corey Autry, who is there this evening and who presented before I was given an opportunity to speak. Mr. Autry says, hi, Fauna. 
I wanted to provide you additional information we obtained from AT&T's risk manager. Yes, AT&T always self-insures for pollution coverage. And he goes on to talk about the pollution coverage and the self-insurance. And then he says, we are insured for EMF, period. No proof has been provided to the city that EMF coverage exists or in what amount. No proof has been provided to the city that self-insurance by AT&T provides coverage for pollution or that there is no exclusion under the existing policy. If you turn to the next item, which is exhibit G, this is the certificate of property self-insurance provided by New Singular Wireless LLC to the city. It does not list pollution. It does not list EMF. It says flood, earthquake, business interruption, and loss of rents. Accordingly, this entity has not provided your city with proof of adequate insurance as requested by your own risk manager. It has not complied with the terms and conditions of the master license agreement. And my recommendation to this body would be that the matter be sent back to the planning commission and that AT&T or AT&T Mobility or New Singular Wireless LLC resubmit the application under a proper name so that the city can be assured that the indemnity provision is in force and effect and further that AT&T or AT&T Mobility or New Singular Wireless LLC provide a copy of their policy of insurance with copies of exclusions and proof of self-insurance for EMF coverage and pollution. And on that basis, I would submit it. Thank you for considering my position. And I would just ask that if individual council members speak, could you please identify your name? Because I've got a court reporter transcribing this proceeding. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, do any council members have questions for Mr. Pollack? I have a question for the city attorney. Do you want to comment on those assertions that Mr. Pollack has made? My name is Diane Dixon. Yeah, so we do, we've taken a look at all the arguments that were made, and we've gone over them with staff, and we think the entity is the proper entity. We think the insurance is proper. We don't see any legal issue here. Um, I think you can make all the findings that the planning commission made and uphold their decision. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from council? So we'll now hear from the public, who will be given up to three minutes each to make comments. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Avery, members of the uh, council. Uh, this is Jim Mosier. As I uh, tried, tried to explain in, in writing, my understanding is that when an appeal comes to you, the hearing tonight is what is called de novo, which means it's a totally fresh look by you at the application that the Planning Commission looked at. It's not limited to the issues that the appellant may have raised. So I want to bring to your attention a slightly different issue, and that is the search for alternative sites or installations to the one that's being proposed. As you may know, our zoning code and our coastal implementation program both rank various kinds of installations in order of their obtrusiveness or desirability for approval. As Ben mentioned in his presentation, this installation on a street light in the public right of way is not the highest priority. It's what's called class three. A installation of the antennas on a light pole that was on private property would apparently be class two, which is more desirable and an antenna on a commercial 
rooftop, which was hidden or disguised, would be even more desirable. Class one. I don't know if utility poles or light poles on private property were investigated, but as to the antennas on rooftops, the highest priority, I have heard at this location and elsewhere that they aren't looked at because AT&T's antennas do not work. Their small cell technology does not work on rooftops. It has to be put on the top of a utility pole. And my only comment to that is our president says that the United States is the greatest nation in the world, if not the universe, and the idea that we cannot come up with small cell technology that works on a rooftop, I think, is a little bit sad. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other public comment? Any phones? Yep. Hello, please go ahead. Thank you for my time tonight to support uh, the appeal to make sure you deny this small cell facility because there are many problems with this application and it remains incomplete to this day. I have studied the application files intensely. In fact, I'm very experienced at this. Uh, we have now over 200 complaints to the FCC for a very common issue, and that is that these things are going forward without required NEPA review. And so it's very simple to take the calculations to figure out whether or not NEPA review is needed, and in this case it is. And unfortunately, NEPA review doesn't exist here, so you cannot actually issue this permit until there's NEPA review done by the applicant. Here's the rule that we're talking about. It's Title 47 CFR, Section 1.1307B. And they talk about uh, exactly what is needed when a antenna is less than 10 meters from the ground. They mean the lower edge of that antenna. And the total power output of all channels is greater than 1,000 watts of ERP. Well, this turns out to be a Galtronics antenna, antenna that's very common. They use it in different cities, including Mission Viejo. And you add that all up, and you see that you have 10 ports. And you look at the maximum output from, uh, that's capable for the antenna and multiply it by its antenna gain and add it all up. 4,970 watts of ERP. That is over just about five times greater than the requirement for the rule, greater than 1,000 watts of ERP. Now we just take out a tape measure, and we say with a pole that's 34 feet 9 inches tall, you subtract 12, 24 inches for the height of the antenna, you're 32 feet 9 inches. That is below 10 meters. Bing! You qualify. By rule, there's nobody's opinion here. This just must happen. And so this one actually will also be reported to the FCC, and we will make sure that uh, every applicant fo follows proper procedure when they actually want to put small cells in. The reason you want to do this is when you have 5,000 watts ERP, literally feet from people's homes, now you have to take a look at what are the frequencies. They said they were 4G only, but actually the antenna can do more than that. In fact, they have 5G frequencies on this antenna. And so those are 3550 to 3750 to 5925 megahertz. So even much of the application has fraudulent information in it, and they try to hide that information from you. And this is what they're in the business of doing every day. They're trying to bamboozle city councils into believing that this is a small cell. Hey, the only metric that matters is how many radiation units you have in your bedroom. That's what matters. And when you get compared to a macro tower, you should have something that gives you five bars on a cell phone. That would be .002. What this is one is going to do, it's probably less than 50,000. It's probably going to be like 25,000. But heck, you know, that's still 12 and a half million times more. That's not necessary. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Nothing on the phone. All right, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and the matter uh, returns to council. Uh, the appellant gets a uh, five minute Hi. rebuttal. I'm sorry, the applicant gets yeah, five minutes. Excuse me. Um, if 
the uh, applicant gets five minutes for any rebuttal to that last comments. Uh, I, I'm not sure the speaker referenced NEPA, which is the National Environmental Protection Act. That's a, a federal law that applies to federal agency decisions and not to um, state and local government. CEQA applies in California, as I'm sure you all know. Um, I, I, I won't otherwise respond to that comment. I'm not sure I followed all of it. Uh, I think I've already addressed the legal arguments. I, um, there's, there's nothing new to report there, and, and we concur with the city attorney's assessment. Um, Corey, do you have anything further to add? Can't hear. Comments regarding um, private property was maybe interpreted incorrectly. We're not saying small cell technology can't Mr. work. Mr. Autry, can you, know, you mechanically um, please? on private property? We're saying it does not work um, from a radio frequency propagation uh, as far as. Can you hear me? Mr. Autry, my apologies. The speaker, the, the microphone was not on when you started, so go oh, ahead. Oh, okay. Thanks. Oh, so I get a second chance. That's good. <laughs> um, I was just responding to Mr. Mosier's comment regarding why we can't go on private property. And um, it's not that mechanically small cells wouldn't necessarily work on private property, but um, it boils down to two major um, items one has to do with the fact that we have rights to be in the public right-of-way there are a number of laws that support AT&T's access to the right-of-way I won't go into all of them um, so that's you know we don't have rights to be on all these different private private properties with this technology and the other major reason is the um, RF propagation doesn't work the same um, if we use uh, infrastructure in the public rights-of-way on utility poles and light poles, then we're designing these at a consistent antenna height. And we're also able to propagate that antenna signal in a 360 degree um, pattern around uh, the pole. And it really lends itself. Um, small cell technology is best um, deployed in the public rights of way. So just to answer to Mr. Moser. Thank you. Any, sure. Council, do we have any discussion? I'd like to make a motion. May we? Are we at that point? Yes, we are. I, I'd just like some direction, Aaron, to make sure we're clear on. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, what's that? No, no. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so we're, you close the public hearing, and then we'd be ready for a motion if there's no items to be discussed. Public hearing is closed. Now, uh, you can All right, I'd like to make a motion to uphold the decision of the Planning Commission approving the minor use permit. I'll second the motion. All right. All those in favor, please vote. The motion carries 4-0. All right, we'll move to item number 18, uh, COVID update. Um, Ms. Leung. Oh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Council Members. I'll uh, keep this fairly brief um, as there's just a few things. Um, here um, just I think um, at this point uh, people are uh, fairly well aware that um, the Orange County has been moved off of the watch uh, the monitoring list this is now uh, day three so that's very good news um, so that's a real good positive to it um, but I think uh, the important thing is uh, kind of the question of now what 
And what we are waiting for um, from our city side and for our businesses in particular is uh, updated guidance for when we are off the monitoring list, what can open and in what fashion. So um, the governor has certainly talked about um, releasing the new guidance. We are um, anxiously awaiting it. Um, we're hearing right now it's going to be later this week. And certainly the sooner that comes out, the better. And that, that's really critical uh, for us. And I do want to make uh, the distinction because you are hearing a lot right now about uh, a 14 day period and that's really for the schools that's specific for the schools to be able to uh, reopen without getting particular um, authorization from the state and that requires to be 14 days off of the um, the monitoring list so that's separate from our own businesses and um, our own operations there so I just want to um, make sure and clarify that point. Um, and just, I think in general, um, the numbers are looking very good from the information we're getting from the county side. They're saying all the, the data, uh, we're under the, uh, the metrics um, and that all the trends continue to point that way. So right now, um, with all the efforts from, from all, all the residents and businesses, um, it, it appears that um, the, the county is fairly confident that we will, will stay um, on this track uh, right now with, with the, the current trends that are going. So I think that's really positive. Um, and then the other thing I do want to note is the county has been setting up additional testing sites. Part of the uh, metrics requires uh, a level of testing um, and particularly with the schools um, uh, hopefully going on to reopening, they are coordinating to have more testing available. So um, as an example, um, in addition to an Anaheim site, they now are going to be at the Orange County Fairgrounds in Costa Mesa, which is very near us, um, opening this Wednesday. So I think that will be helpful with the testing capacity and turnaround there. Um, and then uh, just real briefly, uh, because we have uh, gotten updates on this prior um, from uh, Mr. Georges, but we continue on uh, processing applications um, for the emergency permit um, for the outdoor um, usage, and we're up over 100 um, on those permits, so we continue to um, put a lot of resources in there to be processing those um, as uh, quickly as we can. Um, on the small business uh, support grant side, um, we are also um, expending a lot of resources to get all the documentation in and cutting the checks. So I'm um, happy to say that we're, we're at over 180 checks issued um, getting those grants out. We are finding that there are some um, who haven't come back with the documentation, so we are reaching into our um, second list, those on the wait list, so reaching out to about 100 of them. So we want to get um, the full um, uh, allocation out there uh, of the funds we have, um, of the uh, COVID um, funds. Um, and then I just want to put the reminder that we had uh, an allocation of monies that we put together, almost half a million, um, about right, right, um, in CDBG uh, funding um, for business grants. So that application period um, goes through uh, August 28th, you can see up here, um, and there's that website um, to get more information and to apply as well. And I think that's um, my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or so, um, comments. Sorry, one, one thing real quick. So uh, there's, um, before I, I want to, I want to send two letters, um, both of them to uh, the governor asking for guidance. One of them is we, we all received an email from Lori Morris talking about um, in-person voting. Uh, and seeking guidance on that. Uh, normally, in a normal year, we would obviously have multiple places for people to be able to vote in person. Um, right now, that uh, doesn't appear to be allowed under governor's orders. I think it'd be helpful to at least just request guidance for in-person voting. Um, and I, I don't wanna send something like that or the second one, which I'll describe in just a second, which is um, one, of the, the, one of the categories of business that was listed were um, Barbershops, nail salons, um, and uh, and beauty salons. Um, I'd like to send um, a letter on on behalf of those entities as well, asking for you know reopening guidance there quickly. Um, and the reason for that is because those in particular are small. They're always small businesses. They're always owned by by folks who have invested a lot of their own personal capital in. Um, and those are businesses that. Um, are already licensed. Um, they have to go through extensive uh, protocols on sanitation before COVID, 
And now that COVID has hit, they had extensive, uh, they, the state had already put out guidance that was rather extensive on PPE. They had invested a lot of money into that PPE. Um, and then they were shut down. And those are not exactly businesses that can go outside easily. Um, and so uh, it would be, and, and as far as I know, they didn't, there hasn't been a trace back to those businesses and for an outbreak. they operate in very sanitary conditions. Exactly, and they operate in sanitary conditions. And as far as, I've, as far as I can tell, California is the only state in the country right now that has closed those businesses. So um, I'd like to just, it would be respectful, but it would just be a, a letter seeking guidance on that. And I'd also like to request guidance on in-person voting, but I didn't want to do that without at least exp you know, discussing or at least mentioning that to us. I, I can't take a vote, but... Unless people strongly object to that, I'd like to I'd like to put those two letters together and just send basically under my authority um, under the policy ordinance that we've got. But like I said, I didn't want to do that without throwing it out there first. Okay, Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, follow back uh, to your slide, if you just on the um, grants that we've given. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't we get 2.1 million? And so yep. we have given out 900 some? Oh no, that, that's the number of, uh, right? 900,000? Yeah, oh, well, I, I could have uh, Tara Finnegan yeah. come up and talk a little more. <laughs> She's that. nodding and talking. Yeah. So we've given out close to a million, okay, that's wonderful, to 183 businesses. And so what's the status on giving away, presenting grants for the remainder of that money? So the. Remaining 100 people, um, so this week SBDC went through our list of the 800 and some that weren't selected and randomly selected the next group of 100. We're kind of vetting that list in-house right now to make sure that they meet some of the basic requirements. They'll notify, we'll notify them this week and they'll start the process of getting their documentation together and we'll get them in the funding process as quickly as we can. So you think by end of September that we'll, that we'll have dispersed all the 2.1 million? We have to do it by the end of, uh, by December 1. Well, so, I hope it's much sooner. I mean, these businesses are just barely clinging to would, life. Yes. Um, it is part of the business, though. They have to turn their documentation. That's been kind of um, a challenging part of the process, is getting all well, that gathered. So I appreciate you working with all them. So very good. Thank you very much. All right. Any other questions or discussions? Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Chief, can you come up? Fire chief. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, uh, poor Chief Boyle, because Chief Lewis knows how to be on the stand as a police officer, and Chief Boyle is just doesn't have that same training. Um, but he's very intelligent, and he has some medical background, which he'll deny to you, but he almost went to med school. <laughs> um, you look much better in a uniform than probably a scrub, so. <laughs> so, Chief, um, obviously... Uh, we had some outbreaks in the city staff in the past. Can you tell us currently how uh, your fire and lifeguards are doing? Yes. So the beginning of July, we started out with um, a couple of positive lifeguards and a couple of positive firefighters. And with contact tracing, we quarantined um, several. And <clears throat> subsequently, while they were quarantined, some more became positive. So throughout the month of July, in about a three and a half week period, we had 72 total lifeguards and firefighters either quarantined or test positive. We currently have all 72 of them back to work full time now. No complications, all recovered fully, luckily, and correct. And feeling healthy. <clears throat> healthy and back to work. That's great. And um, <clears throat> I know that we had the junior guard program and that seemed to be very successful and the children were very happy to participate in that. Thank you again for listening to um, our request and really uh, getting creative pretty impressively. Would you say that program was successful and there were no hiccups to be aware of or is there anything we have to learn from that? That program was extremely successful. We didn't have any known participants that were aware of or instructors that get, become quarantined or test positive or even really become sick for that matter. So um, I attribute that to the instructors. Uh, there was that small outbreak, um, the lifeguard side of the house before that started, which really got their attention, I believe. So they were really good with the distancing, with the uh, instruct instruction to the kids, with their masks, and they really just did a good job. 
Well, I think that's great. And I, we've all seen on social media and we've all celebrated. Um, the mayor had a moving piece about that. All celebrated for these children who had opportunity to come in contact with their peers and to do something outside of their homes and to participate in the legacy program. So I, I can't thank you enough. We still get thank you emails. And I, obviously you send some of them to us, which we appreciate as well. Uh, so thank you to you and your staff for the excellent staffing uh, and planning for that. Um, are there any other um, <clears throat> concerns you have going into the fall for the sake of our first responders that are under your purview? Well, uh, obviously right now on the news are the fires. So we have 17 firefighters deployed up across Napa County, Santa Cruz, Vacaville, and Monterey, three fire engines um, with some with four on each, two battalion chiefs, and uh, three overhead positions where they go and they help the incident command. So that's obviously becoming an issue. There's a lot of lightning that we obviously can't control. The resources are spread thin, and the base camps up there are taking on a whole new look and feel because of COVID and, and how people go to food lines and how they use showers and how they sleep in sleep trailers. So they're really trying to adjust up there. Um, but as far as the, the COVID, we really tighten the reins, if you will. Um, we got our arms around it, I believe. We had to adjust some of our paradigm thinking inside fire stations, inside lifeguard headquarters, which we did. And um, I don't have concerns obviously, anymore for that. I think we, we, um, we faced it head on. Now my concerns have shifted towards the, the wildland fires, and I just hope that San Diego, San Bernardino, or Orange County doesn't experience what Northern California is seeing right now. Well, uh, I'm sorry you're going through this as chief, and it's kind of funny just just piggybacking on the excellent work of our police department. Now we're seeing the excellent work of our fire department. It's been a really stressful year, but we've had a banner year as far as performance goes, and e even our rescue on a on a sailboat. It's been quite a year. If we can do anything for you, let us know. You never ask, because I think you get all the, everything you need from Grace and from staff. But uh, we really appreciate everything you're doing, and our prayers are with your team. And um, thank you again for the great job with Junior Guards. We will be asking for oh. some equipment in September. So oh, yeah, you'll, you'll <laughs> see me. <in> the <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you, Chief. Strike while you can. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you, Grace. Uh, we'll go to public comment on this item. Any public comment on this item? All right. Any calls on this item? All right. Let's bring it back. Um, sorry. Let me just get this. All right, Madam Clerk motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the city council either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the council members who voted with the prevailing side any motions all right i have two adjournments i'm going to read them both um the uh the first adjournment uh for uh former council member dick nichols i reached out to his his uh, uh his wife his widow sandy uh and asked her to help me write this so i'm i'm reading a slightly shortened version of what sandy provided to me uh, Richard Dick Nichols was born on October 25, 1939, in Ottawa, Illinois. His family moved to South Bend, Indiana. He graduated Northwestern with three degrees, a BS in engineering science, an MS in, and PhD in electrical, uh, I'm sorry, in chemical engineering. After graduation, Dick accepted a job in Southern California as an engineer and paid inventor, developing new products in the aerospace, aircraft, and fuel marketing industry, culminating with him holding multiple patents. In 1973, Dick married Sandy Gladys, and they settled in Corona Del Mar. They raised the three children, Kathy, Matt, and Rich. In May of 1975, Dick and Sandy started R.A. Nichols Engineering to provide engineering consulting services primarily for the petrochemical industry. Dick's work was instrumental in the development of gas station pollution control technology. He consulted with the American Petroleum Institute in developing the first air pollution rules governing the petroleum industry, and these rules were later adopted by the US EPA, the California Air Resources Board, and many other air quality districts. In 1978, Dick introduced the Rain Ring style vapor holder to the petroleum industry and has installed over 200 systems in the USA and internationally. Dick was the chief engineer for Rain until he retired in 2015, and Rain rema remains a family business operated by his children. Dick was passionate about politics, starting uh, during his college days. In the late 1980s, Dick was president of the Corona Del Mar Community Association. Later on, he was active with Spawn and Greenlight. He and Sandy became active with the California Republican Assembly, and Dick was elected CRA Senate Director. He became president of that uh, unit of the CRA, which later was renamed the Newport Beach Republican Assembly. 
Dick was elected and served on the Newport Beach City Council from 2002 to 2006. Dick coached AYSO soccer for several years, which by the way, I would have liked to have seen. His boys decided they wanted to play junior All-American football, so Dick volunteered to be assistant coach. Later on, when his boys moved to CDM High School, he was a volunteer frosh football coach for three years. Dick believed in service to God, country, and family. His belief in God provides solace for his family and those that loved him. He is survived by his wife, Sandy, his children and their families, Kathy, Stephen, Jacob, and Marissa uh, Oberfell, Matt and Dylan Nichols, Rich, Joan, Natalie, Andrew, and Hannah Nichols. Um, I'd also like to adjourn tonight in memory of John Hamilton. John Hamilton was proud of his city, his school, and most of all, his family. His late mother, Patricia Riley Hitt, gave him an early example of giving back in big ways. She was the first female national co-chair of a presidential campaign for Richard Nixon in 1968 and served as Assistant Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, the highest ranking woman in President Nixon's first administration. John graduated from USC in 1964 and worked his way to eventually being president of the Hamilton Company, a residential and commercial real estate agency in Newport Beach. John ensured that his business success translated into community success. He was involved with a number of charitable and community organizations, including Goodwill Industries, Big Brothers, the Pacific Club, USC Associates, Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation, and the Richard Nixon Foundation. He drove the development of the USC Athletic Hall of Fame in 1994 and served as its chairman until 2015. For his efforts, he was inducted into the USC Athletic Hall of Fame in 2015. He also received USC's Alumni Service Award. In 1994, he founded the Newport Sports Museum in Newport Beach, which housed 12,000 items of sports memorabilia until closing in 2014. Besides displaying rare sports artifacts from around the world, the Newport Sports Museum's mission was to keep youngsters in school and off of drugs by getting them involved in athletics. In 2003, John co-founded and chaired the Impact Foundation at the Pacific Club in Newport Beach, which annually awards the Lot Impact Trophy to the nation's top defensive college football player. He is survived by his wife, Kathy, who has had her own long service, uh, long, long period of service in this community. Their son, John Jr., daughters Kate and Jill, brother Rick, and 10 grandchildren. John passed away on August 5th, and the world is better off because he fought the good fight, he finished the race, and he kept the faith. We stand adjourned. Mm -hmm.